Hi, welcome back guys. This is your friend, the DN What If, with another fanfiction. This is the first part of What If Deku Becomes a Military Commander. All credits for this video go to their respective authors. So please support the real author. Check out the link in the description for more details. Please give this video a like and subscribe to the channel if you want more videos like this. Now let's get into the fanfic. Inko Midoriya, a woman in her mid-twenty seconds, found solace in the tranquility of the park, seated on a weathered bench. Beside her, Mitsuki Bakugo, a longtime friend, shared the latest misadventure of her son Katsuki, who had managed to break yet another dish. Amidst their conversation, the park echoed with the laughter of children playing near the sandbox. Two youngsters, Izuku Midoriya with his unruly green curls and Katsuki Bakugo with a mop of blonde hair, sat in the sand pit, eagerly awaiting the manifestation of their quirks as they approached their fourth birthday. Katsuki, the more outspoken of the two, boasted confidently, when I get my quirk, it will be as strong as all might's. I'll be the next number one hero, and you'll be my sidekick. Izuku, his eyes gleaming with admiration, nodded in enthusiastic agreement. Unbeknownst to the mothers engrossed in their conversation and the aspiring young heroes absorbed in their dreams, a shadowy figure observed the scene with mild interest. The entity, imprisoned within the depths of the forest for centuries, had found amusement in witnessing the innocent aspirations tainted by society's hero labels, even among the youngest generation. His tar-black skin blended into the shadows, rendering him invisible to ordinary human eyes, thanks to the sealing efforts of those he called damned angels. Considering the spectacle before him, the entity contemplated returning to the depths of the forest when a peculiar occurrence caught his attention. Izuku, the green-haired boy, was staring directly at him. Intrigued, the entity raised an eyebrow, his stoic expression revealing no emotion. To his surprise, the child approached, excitement radiating from his every step. Within minutes, the boy stood before the entity, bubbling with curiosity. Hey, sir, what's your quirk? Izuku asked, his eyes wide with wonder. Are you a hero? The entity chuckled, lowering himself to the child's eye level. And why would you like to know that, child? He inquired, awaiting the boy's response. Eagerly, Izuku rambled. Well, because I find quirks so cool. Plus, to be a hero, you must have a quirk. So, knowing as much as you can about it would be something everyone else should have. Intrigued by the child's innocence, the entity peered into Izuku's soul. What he saw in the tapestry of fate compelled a twisted chuckle to escape his lips. Oh, child, life is about much more than quirks or heroes. Life is actually much less. No, life is about survival, and it appears that you will have to learn that perhaps a bit too soon. As the entity's words hung in the air, a sense of foreboding settled over the park, the invisible threads of destiny weaving their complex patterns around the unsuspecting children. In the heart of a dense forest, a secluded lake cradled the entity's moments of reflection. Whenever the entity grew weary of wandering, it sought solace near the calming waters, listening to the rhythmic melodies created by nature. Amidst the tranquil setting, memories of the distant past resurfaced, like ghosts returning to haunt the present. The entity's mind journeyed back to an era when freedom was its only companion. In those times, it reveled in chaos, orchestrating the downfall of villages and entire nations. Its loyal army, although now lost to the annals of history, had once carried out its every command with unwavering dedication. As the entity assumed a meditative pose by the lakeside, the echoes of its malevolent past danced within its consciousness. However, a decision took shape within the recesses of the entity's ancient mind. Fate had cast its darkened gaze upon the green-haired boy, Izuku. While the entity harbored no altruistic intentions, the prospect of a new source of amusement beckoned. Life in the forest, marked by the monotony of stalking wildlife, had begun to lose its luster over time. A lifeless crow, devoid of the vitality of the creatures that once soared the skies, alighted on the entity's shoulder. The entity's lips curled into a cruel smile, relishing the power it held over this animated messenger. A decision hung in the air, one that would undoubtedly draw the attention of the elusive entities that had confined him to this earthly realm. With a calculated command, the entity addressed the crow, its voice a sinister whisper carried on the wind. Find that boy, green hair, green eyes, small, energetic, and all that. When you do the entity affixed an amulet to the crow's beak, a sinister token that bore the weight of impending malevolence. Make him bleed on it. With its master's charge embedded in its hollow existence, the crow took to the skies, leaving the forest in its wake. Its wings sliced through the air as it ventured into the unknown its eyes scanning for the telltale signs of the hero-loving child whose fate had become irrevocably entwined with the ancient force now in pursuit. The forest held its breath, as the cogs of destiny continued to turn, the sinister dance of past and present setting the stage for a malevolent encore. 
On a serene Sunday morning, Izuku awoke with the anticipation that only a child on the brink of his fourth birthday could harbor. The routine of preparing for the day unfolded in a blur as he rushed through the bathroom rituals, his mind preoccupied with thoughts of the impending revelation of his quirk. It had been a year since the peculiar encounter with the mysterious man near the park, a memory now distant and overshadowed by the excitement of the day. Today was not just any birthday. It was his fourth birthday, a day he believed would usher in the manifestation of his long-awaited quirk. Little did he know, fate had a different plan, one that would shape his destiny in ways he couldn't fathom. In his eagerness, Izuku descended the stairs, passing his father engrossed in paperwork without a second thought. The kitchen, a hub of morning activity, welcomed him. Clutching his cherished All Might plushie, he positioned himself beside his mother, who orchestrated the morning routine. Mom, Mom, it's today. I'll get my quirk. Can we go to the doctor's now? So I know my quirk immediately, Izuku exclaimed, his eyes sparkling with anticipation. In response, his mother, Inko Midoriya, chuckled and promised they would leave shortly. As the minutes passed, Izuku devoured a plate of katsudon, his mother's culinary creation. The prospect of discovering his quirk fueled his excitement as they eventually sped towards Musutafu General Hospital. On the way, they passed the city center, adorned with a towering statue of All Might, the symbol of peace and the number one hero. Izuku, gazing at the statue, declared, One day, I'll be as strong as you, All Might. His mother, glancing in the rearview mirror, chuckled sweetly, recognizing the innocence in her son's aspiration. Arriving at the hospital, the air buzzed with anticipation. In the waiting room, fate's invisible threads tightened around Izuku's destiny. When they were finally ushered in, a friendly old doctor greeted them, initiating the pivotal moment. During the examination, the doctor, feigning cheerfulness, inquired about Izuku's aspirations. With unwavering enthusiasm, Izuku expressed his desire to be a hero like All Might. A subtle scowl flashed across the doctor's face, swiftly concealed by a false smile. However, the scissors of fate cut through the tapestry of Izuku's destiny as the doctor delivered the crushing news. This Midoriya, I am sorry to inform you, but your son is quirkless. Inko's eyes widened with shock. And as she turned to look at her son, a surge of motherly protection was born. Confusion clouded Izuku's eyes as he sought an explanation. The doctor, with feigned pity, explained, It means, small one, that you cannot be a hero. Now, there are many other. But Izuku ceased to hear. Static drowned out the doctor's words, his world collapsing with the revelation. Unbeknownst to both the boy and fate, hands devoid of light reached across the ethereal plane, retying the severed cords of destiny. The entity, who had defied fate's plans, had intervened, and the story rewrote itself. As tears streamed down Izuku's face, his mother, burdened with the weight of pain, led him back to the car. Above, a crow with a black amulet flew unnoticed, its mission accomplished. Little did they know, the first chapter of a tale drenched in blood, pain, and chaos had begun. And the gods, both benevolent and malevolent, observed from their cosmic perches, seated on a chair amidst a macabre scene. The entity surrounded by the metallic scent of blood, casually perused a newspaper. Bodies lay scattered, remnants of a manifestation of its destructive power. Within this gruesome tableau, an endless void unfolded, divided into two realms, one bathed in light with a central green flame, and the other shrouded in darkness, at its core housing the ancient entity. The entity raised its gaze from the newspaper, contemplating the formidable barrier that separated it from influencing the mind of the quirkless green-haired boy. The child, now five, blissfully unaware, accompanied his mother to kindergarten. Unbeknownst to both, the entity had occupied the boy's mind for a year, patiently awaiting the opportune moment. The entity found itself facing a translucent barrier, tinted in a subtle yellow hue. Despite the entity's most potent attacks, the barrier stood unyielding. The real challenge, however, was the flame within the child that fueled his aspirations. The news of his quirkless status had momentarily dampened it, but over the year, it had rekindled its vigor. A sinister chuckle emanated from the entity, recognizing the upcoming challenge of corrupting the child. It acknowledged that it wouldn't need to exert much effort. Society would play a significant role in breaking down the barriers. The quirkless boy, already an outcast in kindergarten, had lost his best friend due to societal prejudices, forming small cracks in the once impenetrable barrier. The entity chuckled, contemplating the child's dreams of heroism. It decided to allow Izuku, once the barrier shattered and the entity bestowed a fraction of its power upon him, to pursue his dreams. Why? The entity's purpose wasn't solely to destroy or heal society. It sought amusement, having grown bored of its prolonged imprisonment. Back in the forest by the lake, the corpses of three beings from another universe lay as evidence of the entity's previous source of entertainment. These beings, part of the group that had imprisoned the entity since the time of the Holy Roman Empire, had met their demise at the hands of a mythical creature, the New. The New returned to the void within Izuku's mind, an arsenal of mythical creatures controlled by the entity seated on its chair. 
observing through Izuku's eyes. The entity witnessed the quirkless child being tormented by his once best friend Bakugo Katsuki and his lack. A cruel laughter echoed within the entity, anticipating the inevitable breakdown of the barrier. As more cracks appeared, the laughter intensified, partly from the misfortune of its victim and mostly from the satisfaction of expectations being met. The entity ceased its laughter, returning to the newspaper. The headline foretold a fate even more brutal than Izuku's, an unborn child with gray hair and the power to rewind time. A dark chuckle escaped the entity, acknowledging that perhaps it wasn't the cruelest being in existence after all. The entity immersed itself in the intricate tapestry of fate, finding amusement in the unfolding tragedies and orchestrations. The morning after my fifth birthday felt different. Mom's smile seemed a little forced, and I couldn't shake the feeling that something had changed. But I was excited to go to kindergarten, especially after a year, the news of not having a quirk still in my mind. As mom and I walked hand in hand to the kindergarten, I couldn't help but notice the vibrant colors of the flowers in the neighborhood gardens. They always made me feel hopeful, even on cloudy days like today. We reached the kindergarten gate, and I took a deep breath, ready to face whatever challenges awaited me inside. Mom squeezed my hand reassuringly. Her eyes filled with unwavering love and support. Have a wonderful day, Izuku. Remember, I'm always here for you, Mom said, her voice warm and comforting. I nodded, trying to muster up the courage to face the unknown. With a final hug from Mom, I stepped through the gate, the familiar sounds of laughter and chatter filling the air. Inside the kindergarten, my heart sank as I realized that my best friend, Katsuki, was nowhere to be seen. The other kids seemed to avoid me, their whispers echoing like distant thunder. I tried to put on a brave face, plastering a smile as I made my way to the play area. But my attempts at blending in were futile as the other children formed their cliques, leaving me alone on the sidelines. Feeling isolated and dejected, I wandered aimlessly, my thoughts swirling with confusion and sadness. Why had Katsuki abandoned me? Was it because I didn't have a quirk? Did I do something wrong? Lost in my thoughts, I barely noticed when the teacher called for circle time. Reluctantly, I joined the other children, my mind still weighed down by the events of the morning. During circle time, the teacher asked us to share what we wanted to be when we grew up. My heart skipped a beat as I thought about my dream of becoming a hero like All Might. But as I opened my mouth to speak, doubts clouded my mind. What if the other kids laughed at me? What if they made fun of me for not having a quirk? My palms grew sweaty, and my throat felt dry as I struggled to find the courage to speak up. But then I remembered Mom's words, about being brave and true to myself. Taking a deep breath, I squared my shoulders and raised my hand, determined to voice my dream despite my fears. I want to be a hero, like All Might, I said, my voice trembling but resolute. The room fell silent, all eyes turning to me in surprise. For a moment, I feared their judgment, their ridicule. But instead of acceptance, there was only rejection. Laughter erupted, and whispers of mockery filled the air. The teacher's smile faltered, replaced by an uncomfortable glance, and she swiftly moved on to the next child. Alone and rejected, I felt the weight of their judgment, the sting of their laughter, crushing my dream and spirit. As the day went on, I found myself surrounded by a sea of indifference and hostility. And as I looked out at the world beyond the kindergarten walls, I knew that the challenges ahead would be even more daunting. But I vowed to face them with the same determination and bravery that had brought me here today. The air hung heavy with tension as I stormed into the kindergarten, an unsettling feeling gnawing at the pit of my stomach. The events of the past year had changed everything, and not for the better. My once best friend, Izuku Midoriya, was now nothing more than a shadow in my memory. I pushed through the entrance, my eyes scanning the room for any sign of the quirkless green-haired kid. There he was, standing alone, his eyes filled with a mixture of determination and sadness. As much as I wanted to deny it, I couldn't shake the guilt that lingered within me. The whispers and laughs of the other kids surrounded him, an invisible barrier of rejection that he seemed oblivious to. I clenched my fists, a surge of anger boiling within me. Why did he have to ruin everything? Why did he have to be so damn stubborn about his hero dreams? I approached him, the words bubbling up like molten rage. Hey, Deku, still dreaming of being a hero. Pathetic. His eyes flickered with a mixture of hurt and defiance, but he didn't say a word. I smirked, relishing the discomfort in his eyes. But deep down, a part of me, a tiny voice I refused to acknowledge, whispered that I was the pathetic one. The teacher called for circle time, a chance for each kid to share their dreams. My eyes locked onto Deku, his hand hesitantly rising as if challenging the storm of laughter and mockery that awaited him. I want to be a hero, like All Might, he declared, his voice wavering but unwavering. The room fell silent, and for a moment, I wondered if the others were actually buying into his nonsense. But then the laughter erupted, a tsunami of ridicule crashing over him. I joined in, unable to resist the current, the satisfaction fleeting but potent. The teacher moved on, 
and the room buzzed with whispers. But in the midst of the chaos, Deku remained resolute, his dream undeterred. It infuriated me. How could he stand there, facing all this mockery, and not break? As the day unfolded, I found myself avoiding him, unable to shake the nagging feeling that I had crossed the line. I scoffed at the sentiment, convincing myself that he deserved it. But in the depths of my soul, an uneasy truth lingered, an uncomfortable awareness that our friendship had shattered, leaving behind nothing but regret and resentment. It had been a long nine years, but finally, the cracks in the barrier had grown into gaping chasms, threatening to shatter the fragile divide between light and darkness. In the realm beyond the barrier, the entity observed the impending collapse with a sense of anticipation, its blackened form contrasting against the snow-covered landscape. Mountains rose majestically, mythical creatures roamed freely, and the entity's sentient arsenal awaited its command. But amidst the tranquility, a sense of unrest simmered, echoing the tumultuous events unfolding in the human world. Izuku Midoriya sat at his desk, lost in the world of hero analysis, his thoughts consumed by the aspirations that had fueled him for so long. The whispers of ridicule surrounding him only fueled the cracks in the barrier, each taunt another blow to his already fragile spirit. Meanwhile, the entity savored the bitter taste of tobacco, the smoke curling around its form as it perused the newspaper. Lady Nagant's tragic tale unfolded before its eyes, a grim reminder of the darkness that lurked within the world of heroes, as Izuku's tormentors cornered him. Their words cutting deeper than any blade, the entity watched with a mixture of amusement and disdain. Katsuki Bakugo's sneer dripped with contempt, his superiority casting a shadow over Izuku's dreams. I'm meant for greatness in UA, and I won't let a quirkless little nobody ruin it. Katsuki spat, his words a cruel reminder of Izuku's perceived inadequacy. But Izuku refused to back down, his voice trembling but defiant. You don't know if you don't try, right? He stammered, his hope flickering in the face of Katsuki's scorn. Katsuki's response was swift and brutal, his explosion engulfing Izuku's notebook before sending it soaring out the window. The smoking remnants landed in the tranquil koi pond below, a stark contrast to the chaos unfolding within the classroom. As Katsuki's hand rested menacingly on Izuku's shoulder, the final blow came in the form of a callous suggestion. If you want to be a hero so bad, why don't you take a swan dive off the roof and pray for a better quirk in your next life? Katsuki taunted, his words cutting deeper than any physical wound. The cracks in the barrier widened further, the entity's amusement tinged with a hint of curiosity. Despite the pain and humiliation, Izuku remained steadfast, his spirit unbroken amidst the storm of cruelty. For Izuku Midoriya, the battle was far from over. With each insult and taunt, he forged a resilience that would carry him through the darkest of days. And as the barrier between light and darkness threatened to crumble, Izuku stood as a beacon of hope in a world consumed by shadows. As for the entity, it chuckled darkly, its eyes gleaming with anticipation. The stage was set, and the final act was about to begin. In the clash of dreams and despair, only time would tell who would emerge victorious. Izuku clutched his burned notebook, the pages wrinkled and smeared with pond water. His heart weighed heavy with the realization that his dreams faced a seemingly insurmountable barrier. As he walked home, he pondered his existence in a world dominated by quirks, questioning the cosmic injustice that labeled him as different. Taking a shortcut under a bridge, Izuku's thoughts were interrupted when a slimy force snaked around his leg. Before he could react, a sludge villain emerged, delivering a cold ultimatum. Panic set in as the noxious substance enveloped him, and the world blurred as his struggles proved futile. Inside his mind, the entity observed with an indescribable expression. A brief flicker of anger passed through its white pupils. The world was shaking, and as Izuku teetered on the brink of darkness, three thoughts crossed his mind. His inability to save himself, the impending pain for his mother, and a resigned acceptance of his fate. Suddenly, a distant voice roared, smash. A jolt of energy surged through Izuku as he gasped for air. Blinking back consciousness, he found himself saved by none other than the symbol of peace, all might. In the entity's perception, amazement mirrored the flame on the other side of the barrier, burning brighter than ever. Back in reality, Izuku was awestruck, stammering his gratitude. Overwhelmed, he managed to squeak out a request for All Might's autograph. The hero complied, signing Izuku's notebook with a practiced smile. The entity chuckled internally, finding the scene oddly amusing. All Might, with a booming voice, assured Izuku not to fear and directed his attention to the autograph already adorning the notebook. As All Might prepared to leave, Izuku, a shade redder with embarrassment, summoned the courage to ask a burning question that had lingered for a decade. Can I ask you one more question? All Might, the hero, crouching in preparation for takeoff, regretfully declined, citing his duty to apprehend a villain. However, as All Might soared into the sky, he discovered an unexpected hitchhiker clinging to his cargo shorts, Izuku Midori. Baffled, All Might exclaimed, What the young one, what are you doing? Izuku, realizing the recklessness of his actions, could only gasp, I I don't know, surveying the cityscape. 
All Might spotted a public apartment complex rooftop and landed carefully. Turning to the breathless teen, he questioned the impromptu airborne journey. Izuku, still catching his breath, could only manage an unsure response. As Izuku caught his breath, relief washed over him as All Might stood beside him, a beacon of strength and reassurance. Yet, the moment was abruptly shattered as All Might coughed, spurring out a bit of blood. Smoke surrounded them, and in its midst emerged a frail form of a man, so thin he resembled a skeleton. All Might's voice, once booming and confident, now carried a hint of vulnerability as he began to explain a secret not widely known. He revealed the toll hero work had taken on his body, the near disappearance of his stomach, a brutal encounter with a villain kept hidden from the public eye, the strict time limit of his powers, and the scar that marked his struggles. Izuku listened intently, his eyes widening with each revelation. The realization dawned on him that even the symbol of peace, the pillar of heroism, was not invincible. The weight of All Might's words hung heavy in the air as he finished his explanation. As the smoke cleared and silence settled between them, Izuku found the courage to voice the question that had haunted his thoughts for years. All Might, can a quirkless person become a hero? All Might's expression softened, a mixture of empathy and solemnity in his eyes. He placed a hand on Izuku's shoulder, a gesture of both comfort and truth. No, he said, his voice gentle yet firm. Even someone like me can get seriously hurt in the line of hero work. There are many powerful villains, young one, and if someone like me can get hurt, then it is not safe for you to become a hero. Dreaming is okay, young man, but they must remain a bit realistic. Izuku's heart sank at the resolute answer, the reality of his situation crashing down upon him. As All Might left the roof, Izuku's world shattered. The barrier that had held back the encroaching darkness finally crumbled, and the entity walked freely around the now diminished green flame. It ordered the shadows to stay put as it extended a hand above the weakened remnants of the once vibrant light. Back in the real world, Izuku stood at the edge of the roof. The weight of All Might's words pressed heavily on his shoulders, and the despair within him mingled with the shadow of darkness that had been steadily growing. Contemplating following Kakan's advice and taking a swan dive, he teetered on the edge of a precipice. Yet, as the echoes of Katsuki's harsh words lingered, memories of his mother flooded his mind. The warmth of her smile, the tenderness in her voice, a lifeline that kept him anchored to reality. Deciding against the leap, Izuku turned away from the edge and approached the door leading to the stairs of the apartment complex. Unbeknownst to the boy, the reason his mother's image popped into his mind was because the entity had made it so. It understood that too much darkness would not bode well for the boy. While it couldn't care much about his well-being, it preferred that the kid stay on the path he was currently treading, the path toward becoming a hero. You see, in a few days, the entity would introduce itself to him. It would reveal what it was and why it had taken residence inside his mind. Now, why would an entity of chaos steer its vessel toward heroism? Well, for entertainment and amusement, of course. And the path of the hero promised far more entertainment than the path of a villain ever could. It had been a few days since Izuku's encounter with All Might. He found himself locked in his room, grappling with the shattering of his dreams by his idol. Scrolling through the internet, he explored various job options such as police work, security, or analysis, anything that might divert his path from the once cherished dream of heroism. Unbeknownst to Izuku, within the depths of his mind, changes were unfolding. The snowy lands of the darkness remained largely untouched, while the light side, now adorned with flourishing vegetation, had transformed into an aged oak, beech forest, adorned with the occasional white willow. At the center, on the border between the two worlds, a holder of a dwindling green flame sat. Ignorant of the metamorphosis within him, Izuku closed his laptop and reclined on his bed. In the recesses of his mind, a cabin stood, hosting the tar-skinned entity. Sipping on rum, the entity, with a predilection for alcohol-induced demise, perused a newspaper. The headline chronicled the fate of an emerging villain named Dabai, whose true identity was Toya Todoroki. A smirk graced the entity's face, recognizing that fate and destiny could be far more ruthless than itself. It had allowed the abuse of a child by his father, and when discarded, rather than letting the soul rest, it fueled a vengeful spirit that now roamed the streets as a burned arsonist, claiming numerous lives. The entity folded the newspaper, stepped outside the cabin, and approached a shrine with a green flame. In its hand, a multicolored marble, predominantly black, white, and gray, symbolizing three powers. The first was black and white flame, the ability to generate black and white fire, among the hottest known. The entity relished in using this power, a formidable attack in its arsenal. The second power was Animal Summoner, responsible for the menagerie within Izuku's mind, allowing the summoning of almost any existing animal, with some limitations. Lastly, Arsenal, the power to materialize any weapon humanity had crafted. The entity chuckled maniacally as it placed the marble over the flame, infusing it with the power it craved. As the flame consumed the marble, burning it away, Izuku Midoriya, blissfully unaware, 
was no longer powerless. In the outside world, Izuku struggled to find sleep, rest eluding him as he tossed and turned. An unsettling feeling lingered in the air, disrupting the tranquility of his room. Opening his eyes, he rose from his bed and silently treaded to the bathroom. There, he confronted the reflection in the mirror, a haunting image of fatigue, with deep eye bags, disheveled hair, and glazed eyes. The stark contrast to the vibrant, hopeful Izuku of weeks past was unsettling. As he prepared to splash some water on his face, a sudden shift in the air filled the room with tension and malice. Intrigued, he glanced back at the mirror only to find a mysterious stranger standing beside him. The figure donned a black military trench coat, matching dress pants, combat boots, and a cap reminiscent of a military officer. The most striking features were the tar-like skin and the eyes, an endless black void with a white core, forming the iris and pupil. With a sadistic and malevolent tone, the stranger addressed Izuku as if they were old acquaintances. Bewildered, Izuku searched for the stranger in the physical space beside him, finding nothing but empty air. Returning his gaze to the mirror, he discovered the enigmatic figure still present. The stranger spoke again, revealing a connection that sent a chill down Izuku's spine. Midoriya Izuku, it has been a long time since we last spoke, the figure uttered, its words lingering in the air. Confused and alarmed, Izuku questioned the identity of this mysterious being. WH who are why you? Stammered Izuku, his voice betraying his timidity. The stranger, seemingly relishing the uncertainty, offered a name, the last name it had carried years ago. Well, I never really had a name that stuck. Names come with renown, and that's not something I need just yet. For now, call me by the last name I had some years ago. Gaimai. The revelation hung in the air, leaving Izuku grappling with the unsettling presence and the implications of his newfound connection to this enigmatic entity. What do you want with me? Izuku questioned, his voice trembling with uncertainty. Kaimai, the entity that had now revealed its presence, responded with a chuckle and unsettling amusement underlying its words. What I want with you, Midoriya, is entertainment. For a long time, I had none. However, eleven years ago, our paths crossed. Initially, I dismissed our conversation. But after weeks spent in my nature-bound prison, I made a decision. I realized that fate intended for you to take a leap from a roof, a swan dive as your old friend so eloquently put it. Yet, I intervened. You became the source of my amusement. And to keep that entertainment alive, I intertwine myself with your mind. In return, you gain power. An ancient power that predates even the ancestors of dinosaurs, Gaimai explained cryptically. The entity hinted that three abilities had intertwined with Izuku's body, leaving the specifics for Izuku to decipher. Gaimai expressed a wish for luck in Izuku's future endeavors, implying that challenges lay ahead. Without further warning, the mysterious figure vanished, leaving behind a bewildered and confused Midoriya Izuku. The encounter left Izuku grappling with the newfound knowledge of an ancient entity dwelling within him, its motives wrapped in shadows and enigma. Gaimai, the ancient entity, nestled in the snowy forest, clad in a snow camouflage suit, observed three intruders in the mind of its vessel, Midoriya Izuku. They set camp around a campfire, unaware of the peril lurking in the shadows. A raven perched atop their tent, eavesdropping on their conversation. Has Shino seen any more animals? Questioned the deep blonde-haired individual. Negative, Kumagai. Those deer were the only ones, replied Hashino. The trio conversed. Their casual banter juxtaposed against the tension of their surroundings. Gaimai's gaze narrowed as it aimed its rifle at Kumagai's head, the cause of the deer carcass that alerted the entity. Lighten up, Hashino, remarked the third member, Kanishi Hibiki. Why did we even accept this mission? Pondered Kumagai. Don't know, but regretting it, retorted Hashino. I told you, it's Hibiki. She retorted. The atmosphere tensed as Gaimai's finger hovered over the trigger. A lurking grizzly bear and a pack of wolves awaited the entity's command. With a pull of the trigger, Kumagai fell, initiating the assault. The wolves pounced, and the grizzly bear emerged from the shadows. Hashino, armed with a sword, fought back, but the wolves overwhelmed him. The raven watched with anticipation as the forest echoed with screams. As the carnage unfolded, Gaimai rose, its presence looming over Kanishi. With malice dripping from its voice, it demanded answers, threatening torture. Kanishi, paralyzed with fear, attempted to escape, but Gaimai's warning went unheeded. With a swift blow, she fell unconscious. The entity, unsatisfied, commanded the beasts to consume the intruder's corpses, leaving a warning for any who dared trespass. With Kanishi in tow, Gaimai departed for its cabin, leaving behind a scene of darkness and dread. The forest whispered tales of its wrath, a grim reminder of the consequences of crossing paths with the ancient entity within. Meanwhile, Izuku sat at his desk, pondering the events of the previous day. A notebook in front of him contained a futile list of quirks he considered, all to no avail. Perhaps it was just an illusion, he thought, sighing in exhaustion. Suddenly, a tap on the window caught his attention. A buzzard, an uncommon sight in Japan, greeted him. The bird tapped with its beak, and Izuku, fatigued, opened the window. 
the buzzard flew in, perching on his desk, and dropped a letter before swiftly flying away. Curious, Izuku opened the letter and found a message from Gaimai. Hello there, my vessel. Do not question how this works, I won't explain it to you. Due to a situation, I'll clarify two of the three abilities you possess through me. Firstly, Animal Summoner allows you to summon any non-extinct animal, with their loyalty guaranteed. Start with birds, they'll be very useful. The second one is Arsenal. You can materialize any weapon crafted by humanity, from small blades to vehicles partially used in war. While seemingly modest, your clever mind will soon unveil their true potential. Yours truly, Gaimai. As Izuku absorbed this information, he thought of a small switchblade. To his amazement, a blade slowly materialized in his hand. A laugh escaped him, realizing that with these newfound abilities, he might just have the means to become the hero he aspired to be. Kanishi Hibiki found herself bound to a chair in a dimly lit cabin, the cold metal of the chair sending shivers down her spine. The room contained an eerie light, a sturdy metal door, and a table adorned with an array of ominous tools, pliers, a hammer, saws, knives, a canister of gasoline, and other instruments of torture. Her mouth was tightly sealed with duct tape, limiting her ability to respond. The metal door creaked open, revealing the ominous figure that had claimed the lives of her two comrades. This time, it donned a black military trench coat, a matching cap, sturdy boots, and dark pants. As the door closed behind it, the figure began to speak. Look here, lady. I'll tell you once more, it began, its voice dripping with a sinister edge. You'll tell me how you got here and who sent you. You can either cooperate willingly, or we can explore the less pleasant alternative. The tape sealing Kanishi's mouth was removed, prompting her to defiantly spit at the entity's face. How's that for an answer, huh? She defiantly shouted, only to be met with a brutal strike, a hammer breaking one of her fingers. Now, now, miss, no need to be this feisty. The entity chuckled, relishing the defiance. I'll ask again, who sent you here? The woman responded with a scowl, resolute in her refusal. Like I'm telling you, she growled. The entity chuckled again, savoring the challenge. Well, then, I've always liked a feisty one. It's fun to see them break. Now then it reached for a pair of pliers, a sinister intent lingering in the air. Let's start with the fingernails, shall we? Izuku Midoriya found himself sitting amidst the wreckage of Takoba Municipal Beach Park, a desolate and abandoned place. The gentle sound of the waves crashing against the shore provided an eerie backdrop as he contemplated the letter from Gaimai and the newfound abilities it bestowed upon him. Surrounded by the remnants of what was once a lively place, Izuku looked up to see a gathering of crows and pigeons, forming a small army of feathered creatures. The crows cawed, and the pigeons cooed, their collective presence both fascinating and unsettling. With a thoughtful expression, Izuku began to address his newfound companions. Okay, so, you all are here to help me, right? He questioned, unsure of how the whole animal summoner ability worked. The crows and pigeons seemed to respond with a mix of caws and coos, creating an odd symphony in the air. Izuku scratched his head, processing the situation. I mean, this is pretty cool and all, but I need to figure out how to use you effectively. Can you guys understand me? The crows caught louder, and a particularly bold pigeon landed on Izuku's shoulder, as if claiming the role of a messenger. He blinked at the avian audience, realizing the potential of his new abilities. Right, so let's start simple. Crows, can you scout the area? Pigeons, I guess you can keep an eye on the sky or something. The crows took off, soaring into the sky, while the pigeons fluttered their wings and perched on nearby structures. Izuku couldn't help but feel a sense of connection with his newfound allies, even if the circumstances were bizarre. As the crows returned, Izuku tried to decipher their message. So, what did you find? He asked, almost expecting them to reply. Of course, the birds only caught in response, leaving him to interpret their actions. All right, it's a work in progress, he mumbled, contemplating the possibilities of his animal summoner ability. Maybe I can use you all for reconnaissance, or I don't know, distract villains or something. Izuku couldn't shake the feeling that his life had taken an unexpected turn. With a determined glint in his eyes, he stood up, surrounded by his feathery army. All right, team, let's figure this out together. We might just become an unconventional force for good, he declared, addressing the crows and pigeons as if they were his trusted companions in a battle yet to unfold. Gaimai sat in its cabin, immersed in the unsettling melody of Tansit Tip of Arasa. A newspaper unfolded before it, revealing the fate of a girl named Himiko Toga. The tragic tale amused the entity, showcasing the harshness of society towards those with unconventional quirks. As it reveled in the darkness of the report, Gaimai couldn't help but notice a recurring theme among these individuals. In its hand, a report detailed every word spilled by the tortured woman. Two days of relentless agony broke her spirit, and the entity now held a pistol, a permanent addition to its arsenal, a cold instrument that had brought an end to her suffering. 
The laughter echoed through the cabin as it reminisced about the woman's screams, highlighting the brutality that lay beneath the surface. Her final desire for death resonated as a testament to the entity's ferocity. The woman's revelation about the Hero Public Safety Commission intrigued Gaimai, a villain's portal, an unwitting journey to an unknown destination. It contemplated the option of dealing with the commission later, but for now, the newspaper grasped its attention. The connection with its vessel, Izuku, relayed news of an army forming, a legion of 78 birds, a blend of pigeons, crows, and house swifts. The entity felt a peculiar sense of pride in its vessel's growing power. As it chuckled to itself, the newspaper provided a gateway to the world's happenings. The story unfolded, and Gaimai reveled in the tales of chaos, despair, and the unpredictable nature of humanity. The entity knew that the boy, Izuku, would soon command both predators and prey, crafting an army under the shadow of his newfound abilities. The song's melody continued, intertwining with the laughter of the entity. The chapter unfolded, words weaving a narrative that danced on the edge of the shadows, capturing the essence of a world spiraling into the unknown. Izuku, surrounded by a swirling flock of 78 birds, pigeons, crows, and house swifts, stood at the thrashed Takoba Municipal Beach Park. As he marveled at the sight of his newfound avian companions, a realization dawned upon him. If he focused intensely, he could perceive the world through their eyes. While he lacked complete control, this revelation offered a unique advantage. The army of birds was now his eyes, extending his reach across Musutafu. With the sun setting in the horizon, casting an orange glow across the city, Izuku couldn't help but feel a surge of exhilaration. He raised his hand, prompting the birds to take flight. The murmuration of feathers created a mesmerizing dance in the evening sky. As the birds dispersed across Musutafu, Izuku focused his mind on seeing through their eyes. A kaleidoscope of visions flooded his consciousness. A pigeon soaring above bustling streets, a crow perched on a high-rise building, a house swift darting through narrow alleyways. The world unfolded before him in fragmented snapshots. In the midst of this avian symphony, Izuku's eyes glazed over, a distant look as if he were peering into another realm. His voice, a soft whisper, resonated with the breeze. It's like seeing the world from a thousand perspectives the city breathes, pulses, lives. The connection with the birds granted him an unexpected gift. The ability to gather information from multiple viewpoints simultaneously. It was as if Musutafu's heartbeat reverberated through the fluttering wings and keen eyes of his feathery companion. A realization struck him. This newfound perspective could be an invaluable asset in his quest to become a hero. Maybe I can make a difference after all, he mused. The birds returned, gradually reassembling around him. Izuku's eyes gleamed with determination as he felt the pulse of the city resonate within him. The sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows over the park. Izuku, now accompanied by his avian allies, stood ready to navigate the complex tapestry of Musutafu. Little did he know that these birds, his eyes in the sky, would become his guiding lights in the unforeseen challenges that lay ahead. Izuku sat at his desk, the new notebook titled Numbers of the Army, Birds, Types, Small laid out before him. The numbers had grown from 78 to 84, with the addition of five Kentish plovers and one western sandpiper. His heart swelled with a small sense of accomplishment as he gazed upon the paper, documenting the expanding ranks of his avian allies. Just then, a tap on the window disrupted his thoughts. This time, a majestic Blackiston's fish owl perched outside, a letter clasped in its beak. Izuku opened the window, and the owl gracefully flew in, dropping the letter onto his desk before departing into the night sky. With curiosity peaked, Izuku eagerly unfolded the letter. Its contents bore the familiar tone of Gaimai's counsel, offering guidance and strategic insight. The entity urged him to expand his bird army to a minimum of 500, emphasizing the importance of creating a network of sentinels across the city. The larger birds would serve as defenders, while smaller varieties would act as scouts, vigilant eyes in the sky. Gaimai's suggestions extended beyond avian reinforcements. He advised Izuku to incorporate native Japanese species to avoid suspicion and recommended the addition of ground-dwelling creatures like cats for added defense. The entity also encouraged Izuku to embark on training in swordsmanship and firearms, starting with small arms and progressing to larger weapons. As Izuku absorbed the instructions and recommendations, a sense of empowerment washed over him. Despite the challenges and uncertainties of being Gaimai's vessel, he found solace in the knowledge that he possessed the means to protect and defend. With determination burning bright within him, Izuku resolved to heed Gaimai's counsel and continue his journey towards becoming a hero. A smile graced his lips as he contemplated the path ahead. Perhaps being the vessel of this enigmatic entity held more promise and potential than he had initially imagined. With newfound resolve, Izuku set his sights on the future ready to embrace the challenges and opportunities that lay ahead. Izuku made his way through the cluttered paths of Takoba Municipal Beach Park, his destination clear in his mind. 
The camper, nestled amidst the debris, served as his makeshift base of operations. As he approached, the creaking door swung open, and a gentle breeze carried the fluttering sound of wings. Entering the worn-down vehicle, Izuku found several birds resting inside. They acknowledged his presence with subtle nods before taking flight through the open windows, embarking on another patrol across the city. The interior of the camper was modestly arranged, with a broken-down couch and a map pinned on a board hanging on the wall. Seated on the couch, Izuku surveyed the map of Musutafu, adorned with different colored marks. Three zones were distinguished, green for safe zones, yellow for moderate areas, and red for danger zones. His birds, now numbering 613, had become a vigilant force in monitoring and safeguarding the city. All right, team, Izuku murmured, addressing the birds that remained perched inside. Another day, another patrol. Let's keep our eyes open, especially in the night sector. Stay low, stay vigilant. The birds acknowledged his words with a series of coos, caws, and chirps, a silent communication between them. Izuku, understanding their unspoken responses, couldn't help but smile. Turning his attention to the map, he noted the concentration of marks in the night sector. That's where we need to be most cautious. Crime tends to thrive in the shadows there. As he spoke, a tree swallow perched nearby, tilting its head as if in agreement. Izuku chuckled, feeling a connection with these creatures that went beyond words. After a brief strategy session with his avian allies, Izuku turned to his notebook, where he meticulously recorded the expanding ranks of his bird army. Pigeons, crows, house swifts, kentish plovers, western sandpipers, tree swallows, Chinese leaf warblers, black kites, merlins, saker falcons, and manx shearwaters, all playing their unique roles in his unconventional army. The thought of adding flightless birds for base protection lingered in his mind, a consideration for the future. But for now, he had another important task at hand. Izuku reached for a container filled with water, making his way to the improvised sink. Carefully, he refilled the water supply for the birds. Stay hydrated, my friends. We've got work to do, he murmured, knowing that the success of their patrols depended on the well-being of his feathered companion. As the birds continued their patrol across the city, Izuku closed the camper door, ready to face the challenges that awaited them in Musutafu's night sector. With a determined glint in his eyes, he whispered to the birds, let's make a difference, one flight at a time. The camper stood as a silent witness to their unconventional journey, a haven for both hero and birds alike in the city's tumultuous landscape. Meanwhile, in the depths of Izuku's mind, the entity lounged in its cabin, an eerie parallel to the unfolding events in Musutafu. A peculiar TV, displaying everything through Izuku's eyes, adorned the space. The entity, seated with a pipe in its mouth, took a drag, its focus fixed on the unfolding spectacle. The screen showcased the intricate dance of birds under Izuku's command, weaving through the city sky as silent sentinels. Gaimai observed the scene as if it were an engrossing show, the corner of its mouth curling into a sinister smirk. Beside the entity, a lifeless hero, Mr. Blaster, lay sprawled out. The result of an encounter in the endless pine forest, where Gaimai swiftly ended the hero's futile attempt to explore the unknown. A grim reminder that the entity reveled not only in the chaos of the external world but also in the dark recesses of Izuku's mind. Gaimai chuckled, smoke swirling around its form as it continued to watch Izuku coordinate his avian forces. The boy, unaware of the entity's omnipresent gaze, commanded his growing army with determination and purpose. Yet, Gaimai had plans beyond mere observation. Unbeknownst to Izuku, a personal encounter with the enigmatic entity loomed on the horizon, a meeting that would transcend the boundaries of the mind, as Gaimai had lessons to impart upon the young vessel. As the TV screen flickered with the continued exploits of Izuku and his bird army, the entity leaned back in its chair, contemplating the impending interaction. The lessons to be taught were not born out of benevolence but rather a twisted desire for amusement. The cabin in the mind's recesses became a staging ground for the intricate dance between chaos and order, with Gaimai pulling the strings in the shadows. The narrative unfolded, and the entity awaited the moment when Izuku would step into the surreal realm within his own consciousness, a place where reality and illusion collided in a macabre display. Little did Izuku know that his journey toward heroism held far more complexities than he could fathom. The entity, with its cryptic motives and sadistic amusement, awaited the inevitable collision of their paths, as lessons in chaos and power lurked just beyond the horizon. As Izuku lay in his bed, drifting into sleep, he found himself suddenly jolted awake by a surreal encounter. He was no longer in his room but rather on a couch, facing the enigmatic entity that resided within the depths of his mind. Kaimai's presence loomed over him, a mixture of amusement and cryptic wisdom emanating from its form. Welcome, my vessel, to your mind, Gaimai's voice echoed, drawing Izuku's attention with a mix of curiosity and apprehension. Izuku, taken aback by the sudden intrusion into his mental sanctuary, gazed at Gaimai with a blend of confusion and intrigue. The entity's tar-like skin and enigmatic aura made it a presence both unsettling and captivating. 
Um, sir what do you mean? My mind? Izuku questioned, his voice laced with uncertainty. Gaimai chuckled, its amusement palpable as it addressed Izuku's inquiry. Oh, come on, boy. No need to be so formal. I've been in your head since you were four. The only person who knows more about you than me is your mother, and you're the only one in Japan aware of my existence. So just call me Gaimai. And as a reminder, Gaimai is not even a real name. It's a code name an associate gave me. Feel better now. Izuku, still grappling with the surreal nature of the conversation, nodded hesitantly. Uh, sure, Gaimai so, Mr. Why am I in my mind? Gaimai leaned back, its smirk never faltering as it delved into the purpose of their meeting. Ah, uh, well, you see, child, I'll be telling you some things you need to have drilled into your head, all right. Izuku nodded again, his curiosity piqued yet wary of what revelations awaited him. First things first, Gaimai continued, its tone taking on a more serious undertone. We'll need to talk about which hero you want to be. I have a suggestion for that. I suggest you become an underground hero. Izuku's mind raced with questions, his thoughts swirling in a whirlwind of uncertainty and possibility. The suggestion of becoming an underground hero sparked a glimmer of intrigue within him, opening doors to a world beyond the conventional confines of heroism. As the conversation unfolded within the recesses of his own mind, Izuku realized that the lessons he was about to learn would shape not only his understanding of heroism but also his very identity as a hero in the making. With Gaimai as his enigmatic guide, the journey ahead promised to be one of self-discovery, challenges, and invaluable lessons learned in the shadows of Musutafu's hero society. Gaimai's tar-like form seemed to ripple with a strange mixture of shadows and ethereal energy as it responded to Izuku's question. Why? I mean, not that I'm against it, of course, I'm just interested why. Izuku inquired, seeking clarity. Gaimai leaned forward, its eyes fixed on Izuku with an intensity that conveyed both wisdom and a touch of melancholy. Well, you see, boy. Not only do you already have an analytical mind, which will make you more useful, but there are a few key reasons. Firstly, becoming an underground hero would allow you to easily gather information in the underworld. You'd be uniquely positioned to navigate the shadows and uncover the secrets that elude others. Izuku absorbed this information, his mind racing with the implications of a hero's role in the shadows. Kaimai continued, another reason is the importance of secrecy. If you were to become a limelight hero, everyone would know your last name. Heroes, civilians, and, most importantly, villains. A quick search on the internet would reveal a social media profile of Inko Midoriya, your mother. By staying in the shadows, you protect not only yourself but those close to you. As Gaimai spoke, it all began to make sense to Izuku, the weight of the responsibility and the necessity for discretion. The entity's tone shifted, hinting at a more personal reason that it chose not to disclose. Izuku, respecting the boundaries presented, didn't press further. Another reason, Gaimai continued, is because you know what it feels like to be an outcast. Many villains turn to their path of darkness due to the hardships and alienation they face. Your ability to empathize with the marginalized may be a powerful force for change. Izuku nodded, realizing that his own experiences could be a driving force in understanding and combating the roots of villainy. And, lastly, Gaimai added with a knowing gaze, you can trust no one. No matter how close you are to someone, circumstances can change. Take back Hugo, for example. It didn't take much to go from best friend to tormentor, huh? The mention of Bakugo stirred a mix of emotions within Izuku, memories of a friendship strained by ambition and rivalry. The gravity of Gaimai's words sank in, reinforcing the importance of vigilance and self-reliance in the tumultuous world of heroism. As the conversation unfolded within the confines of Izuku's mind, the path to becoming an underground hero took on new significance. It wasn't just a career choice, it was a strategic decision rooted in the complexities of human nature and the shadows that lurked beneath the surface of hero society. The valuable lessons had only just begun, and Izuku found himself at the threshold of a journey that would redefine his understanding of heroism and the intricate dance between light and darkness. Izuku listened intently to Gaimai's proposal, contemplating the adjustments to his personality that becoming an underground hero would necessitate. The entity spoke of adopting a cryptic demeanor, cultivating an air of darkness, and embracing a cold and knowledgeable facade. It was a stark departure from the earnest and compassionate Izuku Midoriya that people knew. Gaimai's words hung in the air, the weight of the decision evident in the gravity of the task ahead. Now, to be an underground hero, we're going to have to change your personality a bit. While you can keep your old one with your mother and all that, your new one will be with classmates, co-workers, and teachers. I'm thinking of an underground hero, so best to be cryptic, have some dark tendencies, act a little cold, and know a lot of things about the criminal world. Luckily for you, I fit most of the criteria. So, do you accept this, Midoriya? For a whole month before you can apply to UA, I will train you to become an underground hero before you even enter a heroic school. Do you accept? Izuku pondered the proposition, 
weighing the potential consequences and the sacrifice of part of his identity for the sake of a strategic approach to heroism. The path of an underground hero held secrets, challenges, and a different kind of heroism, one that operated in the shadows, fighting against the darkness that lurked beneath the surface. After a moment of contemplation, Izuku looked up at Gaimai with a determined glint in his eyes. I accept. If this is what it takes to be the hero I want to be, then I'm willing to make the necessary changes. Train me, Gaimai. Train me to become the underground hero Musutafu needs. Gaimai circled around the meditating Izuku, who sat atop one of the many towering mountains in the darker recesses of his mind. The purpose, to cultivate patience. Three days had already passed, and in this mental realm, where time moved at a different pace, each outside hour translated to three days within the mind world. As the fourth day dawned, Gaimai spoke, All right, that's enough. Tell me, how do you feel? I feel a lot calmer. Izuku responded, his voice carrying a newfound serenity. Gaimai chuckled, a sound echoing within the ethereal landscape. All right, it worked. I wonder, Izuku muttered, should I call you Gaimai-sensei? To this, Gaimai raised an eyebrow. I'm not a teacher, Midoriya. So, no, you don't have to. Yeah, I'm calling you Gaimai-sensei. Izuku declared with a smirk. Gaimai sighed, feigning irritation. All right then, the next thing we'll need to do is… And so, a demanding month and a half unfolded for Izuku. At times, he was in the real world, physically training, while at others, he delved into the mind world. In this ethereal space, Gaimai imparted the basics of swordsmanship, spears, and hand-to-hand -hand combat. They honed Izuku's proficiency with firearms, ensuring he could handle a pistol or revolver with semi-professional skill. In the tangible world, Izuku immersed himself in books, delving into the realms of anatomy, weapons, warfare, and combat strategy. It was an exhaustive pursuit, piecing together the knowledge necessary to become a hero of unparalleled intellect. Gaimai's lessons extended beyond the physical and intellectual. He coached Izuku on the art of masking his true personality, guiding him to create a cold, impenetrable wall as if it were a mask. Upon Gaimai's suggestion, when Izuku visited Takoba, he navigated the maze of trash, discovering small, easily accessible yet well-hidden holes. In these clandestine spots, he strategically placed sentinels and alarms in the form of burgish criers, six of which surrounded the camper where the main army would reside. Two more found their places within the camper, and one perched on its roof. Patrolling around the camper were four Dongtao roosters, aided by ten great white pelicans, and the latest addition to the army, a wild boar. As the weeks passed, Izuku's connection with the feathered vanguard strengthened, and his skills expanded exponentially. The training, both mental and physical, set the stage for a hero unlike any other. In the shadows of his own mind, Izuku forged himself anew, ready to face the challenges that awaited him, both within Yue and the darker corners of the hero world. The last few weeks of August had arrived, casting a sense of urgency over Izuku. A roll call among his ranks revealed the unity among his diverse army. No longer just a feathered battalion, with the recent addition of a wild boar, the need for a name change lingered, an acknowledgement of their evolving composition. Gaimai, ever the strategic guide, recommended a shift to weight training for the final stretch of preparation. Though not an extensive regimen, it marked a departure from Izuku's earlier routines. On the sandy shores, three training dummies stood as silent adversaries awaiting the onslaught of Izuku's honed skills. Izuku positioned himself a few meters away, a Glock 18 in hand. The sun dipped toward the horizon, casting a warm glow over the beach as the ocean waves provided a rhythmic backdrop to his training. With a focused gaze, he squeezed the trigger, sending controlled bursts toward the dummies. A crack of gunfire echoed across the beach, punctuated by the thuds of bullets hitting their targets. Two of the dummies bore the evidence of Izuku's accuracy. He holstered the Glock, contemplating the progress made in these final training sessions. Gaimai's ethereal presence materialized beside him. Not bad, Midoriya. Your aim is improving. Thanks, Izuku replied, wiping the sweat from his forehead. But it feels like there's more we need to do. Gaimai nodded, his expression cryptic. You're right. The physical aspect is crucial, but don't forget the mental preparation. Your journey is about more than just strength and skill. What else is there? Izuku inquired, a tinge of curiosity in his voice. Gaimai circled him. The air tinged with an otherworldly energy, perception, strategy, and the ability to adapt. Heroes are not just defined by their physical prowess but by their minds. The battles you'll face will demand more than strength, they'll require cunning and resilience. As the sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows on the beach, Izuku absorbed Gaimai's words. The combination of physical and mental training had become the cornerstone of his preparation. The feathered vanguard, or whatever they would soon be called, needed a leader whose abilities surpassed the conventional. The following weeks unfolded with a balance of rigorous physical exercises and mental conditioning. Izuku's interactions with his diverse army intensified, solidifying their unity. The boar, now named Kuro, became an integral part of their unconventional team. 
As the sun set on the last day of August, Izuku stood on the beach, gazing at the horizon. The imminent challenges at UA and beyond beckoned, but he felt a newfound confidence. The training, both physical and mental, had forged him into a hero of extraordinary potential, ready to face whatever trials lay ahead. Kaimai stood in its cabin, flipping through the TV channels as Izuku headed to the entrance exam. Though Izuku was still officially labeled as quirkless, wielding a sword wasn't precisely a quirk. For now, he would remain officially quirkless until someone figured it out, or until Izuku remembered it himself. Gaimai decided not to warn him, entertainment was essential, after all. Above Izuku, one of Gaimai's animals soared through the sky. A bald eagle that had long been deceased, brought back to life. It acted as an extra precaution against potential threats in the alleys. Several of Izuku's saker falcons followed closely behind forming a squadron ready to strike if the need arose. As Izuku stood in front of the gate, one of the Saker Falcons landed on his shoulder. Dressed in jeans and a hoodie with a bag slung over his shoulder, Izuku carried two essential items in the bag, a falchion sword and a disassembled Armalite R-50. Iwe had strangely allowed the presence of an anti-material rifle, thanks to Gaimai's skill in creating forged documents. As Izuku approached the entrance, he suddenly remembered. He was still officially listed as quirkless. Panicking, he considered the possibility that if he refrained from using his quirk during the exam, everything might be fine. He rationalized that he'd only use the birds for reconnaissance, convincing himself that it wouldn't be a significant issue. After a sleepless night of researching, he concluded that the exam involved robots, no big deal. Lost in thought, he tripped. As he was about to hit the pavement, he found himself floating. His narrowed eyes questioned whether Gaimai had something to do with this. Ah, sorry that I used my quirk on you. A feminine voice exclaimed. Izuku looked at the speaker and realized it was another exam participant. The birds nearby snickered. No worries. Now, could you maybe let me go back to the ground? He asked. Her eyes widened, a small blush forming on her cheeks. Ah, sorry, I forgot to let you go. She held the tips of her fingers together and he descended. Five point touch activation, ha Izuku muttered. Soon, he was a muttering storm of theories, suggestions, and questions. When he stopped, he offered a small smile and said, Good luck, before turning around and heading to UAS Examination Hall. The brown-haired girl had a starstruck gaze before shaking her head and joining the stream of potential heroes in training. The examination hall buzzed with applicants as Izuku settled into his assigned seat, number 5004. Casting a glance around, he searched for familiar faces, but the room seemed devoid of anyone noteworthy until his eyes landed on a certain blonde a few seats away, Katsuki Bakugo. A sigh escaped Izuku. The prospect of attending the same school with his ex-friend wasn't something he particularly looked forward to. After all, he wasn't inclined to seek friendship after the less-than-friendly advice Bakugo had given him. Placing his bag under his seat, Izuku focused as small robots distributed the written test. Question after question, he navigated through the exam finding most of them surprisingly easy to answer. A few, however, puzzled him, such as inquiries about his hypothetical merch store's name and the company he'd partner with, opting for simplicity. He wrote Underground Hero for those and moved on. With 15 minutes to spare out of the 40 allotted, Izuku marveled at Gaimai's unique teaching methods. Whether it was heartless, crazy, or sadistic, there was an undeniable effectiveness to the way it drilled information into his head until he mastered it. In Izuku's case, the method worked well. As he descended the stairs, some onlookers cast strange glances his way. One boy, with blue hair and glasses, dressed in a private academy's uniform, shot him a glare that could rival an intense grudge. Undeterred, Izuku returned the stare with a quick, cold gaze and proceeded to hand his test to present Mike, stationed at the podium in front of the hall. In a hushed voice, present Mike queried, Little listener, are you sure you wish to submit your exam paper already? Izuku, maintaining a composed demeanor, offered a closed smile and a nod. Present Mike received the exam paper, and with each passing question, a perplexed expression crept onto his face. Internally, a small part of Izuku's personality, influenced by Gaimai's chaotic nature, found amusement in the confusion. Externally, he remained calm and composed as he returned to his seat. The room's atmosphere shifted slightly, whispers circulating about the mysterious examinee who had finished the test so quickly. Ignoring the curious glances, Izuku awaited the next phase of the exam, his thoughts contemplating the upcoming practical challenges. The enigmatic aura around him seemed to deepen, hinting at the uncharted path he was about to tread in his pursuit of becoming a hero. As Izuku sat at his seat, he rummaged through his bag, sorting the parts of the R-50 rifle. Alongside it lay a bipod and around 250 BMG rounds. The R-50, a single-shot rifle, had materialized at Gaimai's suggestion after Izuku consulted an old, forgotten website called Wikipedia. With Gaimai's assistance, he had it signed off as a support item. 
First, he created a false identity, Guy My Krob, and established a fictitious gun store that had purportedly existed long before his birth. Following this, he filled out an application, accepted it, and sent the rifle as a support item. Guy Mai even tweaked his birth certificate to show a familial tie, ensuring legality. As the minutes ticked by and more people finished, it was time for the explanation of the practical exam. Present Mike, utilizing his quirk, belted out, Hello there listeners. I hope all of you are confident in your answers. Now then, can I get a hell yeah? Silence ensued, followed by present Mike's muttering about a tough crowd. Anyway, the practical exam is basic, he continued, projecting the silhouettes of four robots onto the big screen. There's a one-pointer, two-pointer, and three-pointer. The third is the hardest to kill but offers three points. Now, interrupting, the blue-haired boy from earlier raised his hand and exclaimed, Sir, there appear to be four robots on the screen. If you forgot to explain that, it's unprofessional. Pointing at Izuku, he criticized. How you acted is completely unprofessional and disgraceful to UAS Legacy. Bags aren't allowed, and you broke the rules. Izuku maintained an unreadable expression as the boy gestured robotically. In a voice reminiscent of Gaimai's, he calmly retorted, How about you ensure you don't accidentally perform the Nazi salute there, buddy, before turning back to the podium? Confusion spread among the crowd at the reference. Given World War II had ended centuries ago, and pre-Quirk era history had largely faded from memory, only three people seemed to catch the implication, the bespectacled boy, Bakugo, and the teacher himself, who nervously chuckled at the remark. Well, someone has a dark sense of humor, the teacher commented, addressing the blue-haired student. Next time, please wait your turn to speak and refrain from rudeness. And examinee number 5004, please be mindful of potentially offensive remarks. Izuku smirked at the teacher's response, while the blue-haired student slumped in his seat, deflated. Present Mike interjected, clarifying that the fourth robot was a zero-pointer, merely an obstacle. With instructions given, the examinees dispersed to their assigned mock cities, anticipation building for the practical segment of the exam. Izuku's mind buzzed with readiness, prepared to face the challenges ahead and prove his worth as a potential UA student. As Izuku stood before the gate of City A, a gathering of examinees surrounded him, including the blue-haired boy rapidly approaching. The boy stopped abruptly and, to Izuku's surprise, offered an apology. You, he began, I wish to apologize for my rudeness. I realize now I might have gone a bit overboard, thinking you were mocking the prestigious institute with how you acted. No, no, I get it, Izuku replied. It was a bit weird how I finished so fast. I had a very good teacher. Also, in the bag is a support item. My quirk isn't really for offense. So I'll mostly need to use support items to even the playing field. And yes, support items that have been accepted by the company you requested them from are allowed. I read the whole rule book. Ida Tenya, the blue-haired boy, nodded. And also, sorry for the remark about the Nazis. I have an uncle who makes a lot of dark jokes and has been an influence for that side of my personality. Izuku chuckled. Well then, good luck to you. Ida Tenya, good luck to you too. Midoriya Izuku, tell your uncle he might have to tone back with his jokes then. I wish you goodbye, maybe we'll be future classmates. Maybe, maybe. And I'll tell him. Izuku thought to Gaimai, uncertain if his uncle would take the advice. The alarm rang, and the doors opened. Izuku expected everyone to rush out, but to his surprise, no one moved. Present Mike's voice boomed through the speakers, go go go. What, do you think there is a timer in a real villain fight? With that, the examinees scattered into the mock city. Izuku waited until the initial sounds of clashes echoed through the air before slipping into an alleyway. Following the plan he had devised, the mock city unfolded before him, a maze of streets and buildings populated with robotic villains. Izuku navigated the shadows, employing his birds for reconnaissance. His avian allies soared above, keeping watch as he planned his strategic moves. The first clash of examinees with the robotic villains reached his ears, and he knew it was time to put his plan into action. As he stealthily moved through the city, a mix of excitement and tension surged within him. The unpredictability of the practical exam fueled his determination to showcase his abilities and prove that unconventional methods could be just as effective. With each step, he embraced the challenges that lay ahead, eager to demonstrate the unique skills honed under Gaimai's guidance. The journey through the mock city had just begun, and Izuku was ready to face whatever obstacles Yue had prepared for him. As Izuku stealthily traversed the alleyways, skillfully avoiding cameras and staying vigilant, his bag slung over his shoulder and the falchion in hand, he left behind a few broken two-point robots. A strategic move that added 12 points to his tally, even though he hadn't intended to encounter them just yet. Reaching a spot shielded from faculty cameras, Izuku carefully retrieved items from his bag. 
Besides the disassembled Arma Light R50, thanks to Gaimai's guidance and his uncle's suggestions, he had a M1942 Stahlhelm, a black blazer with holstered combat knives, a military-grade bulletproof vest, combat boots, and shades. Completing the ensemble, he donned a metal mouthpiece shaped like a jawbone, bearing a sinister engraved smile. With the attire complete, practical yet menacing, reminiscent of many underground heroes, Izuku entered a furnished fake building. Climbing to an upper floor, he found a vantage point through a window. A combat knife shattered the glass, allowing him to assemble the R-50, creating a sniping nest. Meanwhile, in the observation booth, various faculty members watched the examinees. The principal, Nezu, sat alongside Eraserhead, Midnight, Present Mike, Cementos, Ectoplasm, Vlad King, Power Loader, Snipe, and Recovery Girl. All Might, Tashinori Yagi, arrived late, panting heavily, and smiled as he spotted Itsuka Kendo, his newly chosen successor. Observing the screens, comments flowed about the promising heroes. Midnight's provocative remark garnered a racerhead sigh, who admitted some potential. However, Nezu remained silent, focused on a specific monitor. A racerhead joined him, and both noticed a glimmer in one of the apartments. A three-point robot, chasing a crow, appeared on the screen. The crow dodged and led the robot past discarded comrades, where it fell with a hole in its head. All Might questioned the use of a deadly weapon inside the school, and Snipe explained it was the result of a .50 BMG round, commonly fired by an anti-material rifle. Concerned, All Might queried, Wait, a child somehow brought a deadly weapon inside this school? Is that allowed? No, Nezu answered succinctly. He swiftly typed a command, transforming the screen displaying the blonde boy demolishing robots into a dark, night vision view. The haunting silhouette of a figure holding the rifle in its hands became visible. Nezu found it intriguing. With another press of a button, a screen displayed a scan of the rifle, accompanied by a report. Support item, type, rifle, manufacturer, Krob Weapons Industries, modeled after, Armalite R50. Application, accepted by default. User of support weapon, Midoriya Izuku. Examine ID, number 5004. Present Mike. Now aware of the connection, exclaimed, wait, it's that kid. Nezu inquired, which kid? The one who finished the test in 15 minutes and only had some technicalities wrong. Oh, that one. Let's see his profile, shall we? Nezu responded with a smile. He brought up an application trial on one of the screens. Name of applicant, Midoriya Izuku. Guardian, Midoriya Inko. Age, 14. School, Aldera Junior High. Date of birth, 5072309. Place of birth, Musutafu, Japan. Quirk, quirkless. All might express concern. Wait, wait, wait. Are quirkless people allowed to partake in the exams? Cementos clarified, of course. Everyone is allowed to participate, quirk or not. It is the heart that makes the hero, not the quirk. All might acknowledge the sentiment but continued, I know that, but isn't it kind of dangerous for a quirkless individual to be in the line of hero work? The racer had provided insight. Hero work is dangerous for everyone, Yagi. What matters is how people act, not how dangerous it is. Nezu adjusted the night vision to reveal the full scene of the teen adorned in Kai black clothing a military-grade bulletproof vest, and a helmet modeled after a M1942 Stahlhelm. The figure lay with their back to the camera, preventing a view of the face. Nezu wondered aloud, now, where did he get all that? With another click of a button, Nezu revealed a website titled Krob Weapon Industries Clothing, featuring military clothing replicas from the 1,900 seconds to the late 2,022 seconds. All were offered for reenactment purposes and support reason. A search for support companies sponsoring the school yielded one result for Krob, added to the database a few months ago, explaining its acceptance by default. Aizawa sighed, he abused a loophole. By using a sponsored company, one not widely known, he managed to make the system accept the support application without notifying us. Nezu chuckled, so he has the backing of a semi-military manufacturer and a smart mind. Let's see his score. He read out the figures, 71 villain points, by actions calculated 25 rescue points. Present Mike, fascinated, exclaimed, that's quite a remarkable score. The racer had nodded. It seems he's utilizing every advantage available to him. A smart move. All Might, a hint of skepticism in his voice, questioned, but is it fair for a student to bring in such heavy artillery? Shota Aizawa quickly intervened. He's not breaking any rules. If anything, he's leveling the playing field. Heroes come in all shapes and sizes, and so do their tools. Vlad King chimed in, in hero work, adaptability and resourcefulness are crucial. If he's using the system to his advantage, then he's already displaying important qualities. Recovery Girl added, Let's not forget the essence of hero work, saving lives. He seems to be balancing the scales by rescuing people despite his unconventional methods. Nezu concluded with a mischievous grin. It appears we have a very resourceful and strategic individual in our midst. This should be an interesting year.
The faculty continued to observe as the mock city scenario unfolded. Intrigued by the variety of approaches the examinees took to tackle the challenges before them, as Izuku continued his solitary vigil in the room, he peered through the scope, keeping an eye on one of his crow decoys, strategically placed to lure the robots into view. The cold, metallic world of the mock city felt eerily real, yet Izuku remained focused on his objective. After a few minutes, the telltale movement of the crow caught his attention, and in one point a robot emerged, charging towards the decoy. Izuku pulled the trigger with precision. A hole appeared where the core of the robot's chest would be, and he noted down the score, 72, in his journal. Satisfied with his accumulated points, he murmured, should be enough for now. As he pulled the bolt of the rifle back, he savored the moment of accomplishment. The smoke still wafted from the barrel as he leaned against a table, situated sideways for cover. In the silence, under the bone-shaped mouthpiece, a smile formed. Skill, training, and strategic planning had enabled him to master the rifle. Just as he was about to close his eyes for a brief rest, the sound of approaching footsteps stirred him back to alertness. Swiftly, he reached for the ant hardballer holstered at his side, aiming it at the door while maintaining cover behind the table. As the door creaked open, a group of examinees entered, oblivious to the danger lurking within. With the sudden illumination of lights, a conversation unfolded among the newcomers. Izuku listened quietly, still concealed behind the table, feeling a sense of security as the minutes ticked by. Just as he prepared to relax, he heard a familiar sound, footsteps. Clearing his throat, he opened his eyes and aimed the pistol at the door. The surprised trio inside turned towards the voice, and Izuku revealed himself fully. The two conscious members took a cautious step back, eyeing the green-clad figure. The green-haired girl, Takage Satsuna, spoke first, and who are you supposed to be, shithead? Izuku nonchalantly replied, the name's Midoriya Izuku. Now go far away, so I don't hear the moans, alrighty. Redhead Kendo waved her arms dismissively. Hey, no, no, no. We don't do that. I mean, there are cameras everywhere. Who in their right mind would do something like that during an exam? Izuku responded with a shrug. Don't know, don't care. He stood up, revealing himself fully, causing both conscious individuals to take a step back. Relax, will ya? I'm an examinee for a reason. I ain't stupid enough to fire this willy-nilly. He assured, showcasing the pistol in his hand, finger off the trigger, safety engaged. So, you three are. Kendo introduced herself, I'm Kendo Itsuka. The greenette is Takage Satsuna, and the guy is Mono Manito. What's with the clothes? Izuku shrugged casually, wanted to see if the hero costume I designed worked. The weaponry are all support items, so, don't think I bought a weapon illegally. So, what brings you here? He asked, settling back against the table. The room filled with a curious silence after Monoma's inquiry. Izuku leaned against the table, casually holding his pistol as he shared the story of his unconventional support items. Oh my Oji sen owns a weapons manufacturer company, so I kinda got it for free, Izuku replied, his tone nonchalant. Kendo's eyes widened with interest, and she immediately saw an opportunity for personal gain. What's the name of the company? I would like to see if I could buy some high-grade boots, Kendo inquired. She complained about the poor quality of the boots she had for the exam and expressed her desire for something more reliable. Prob Weapons Industries And if you want clothing, go to the online website and check the clothing sector, you'll find some there, Izuku informed her. His response triggered a mental note for Kendo, who envisioned upgrading her gear for future challenges. Monoma chimed in, so, your uncle seems like a pretty cool dude. There was a hint of curiosity in his voice as he tried to understand more about Izuku's connections. Oh, you have no idea, Izuku replied with a sarcastic undertone. His thoughts drifted to the entity, now officially recognized as his uncle on paper. The entity had taken on the role of his mother's husband's cousin when introducing itself to her. The mention of his father arose, a distant memory from years ago when the man passed away in the USA. Gaimai's manipulation of documents had revealed a surprising truth. Most of the individuals on Izuku's father's side had died a few years ago. The news didn't evoke any strong emotions in Izuku. His distant relatives had distanced themselves when he was diagnosed as quirkless. Technically and legally, Gaimai's powers were not quirks, considering the entity's ancient existence and witnessing the dawn of humanity. However, for simplicity, they referred to them as quirks. As Izuku reflected on his newfound identity, Gaimai's powers granted him the freedom to wander outside at times, engaging in activities that remained enigmatic. The concept of identity, family, and the entwining of the supernatural with the mundane occupied Izuku's thoughts. The conversation flowed, delving into personal anecdotes and experiences. Monoma and Kendo shared stories of their own, creating an atmosphere of camaraderie among the examinees who, despite their initial skepticism, found common ground. The exchange of laughter and shared challenges formed the foundation of new friendships in the midst of the UA entrance exam. As the minutes ticked by, 
Izuku, Monoma, and Kendo continued to converse, unknowingly forging bonds that would play a crucial role in their future endeavors at UA. The mock city scenario outside echoed with the clashes of examinees and robots. But within the room, a sense of connection and understanding blossomed. The unexpected camaraderie among these examinees hinted at the potential for alliances and collaborations in the challenging days ahead. Little did they know that the bonds formed in this room would shape their journey as aspiring heroes, navigating the complexities of UA and the unpredictable path that lay before them. The aftermath of Monoma, Takage, and Kendo's departure left Izuku alone once again, perched atop the building with the anti-material rifle in hand. The distant rumbles of the exam persisted, creating an eerie ambience as Izuku scanned the landscape through the scope. A colossal robot, resembling a zero-pointer but towering over the buildings, caught Izuku's attention. He focused on the target through the scope, evaluating its movements and potential weaknesses. Determining that the conventional bullets weren't effective, he pondered his next move. With a hum of contemplation, Izuku summoned a crow and a Chinese leaf warbler. As they landed on the massive robot, he carefully maneuvered himself for a strategic shot. Examining the back of the colossal machine, he identified a hatch, likely housing a crucial component. The realization sparked a plan in his mind. The anti-material rifle roared to life as Izuku pulled the trigger. The .50 BMG round sped towards the hatch, piercing the metal but seemingly having little impact. Undeterred, Izuku thought on his feet, calling upon his avian allies. A crow and a Chinese leaf warbler descended, attempting to enter the newly created hole. The crow, too large to fit through, gave way to the smaller and more agile Chinese leaf warbler. As it entered the machine, chaos ensued. The warbler tore through wires, disrupting the robot's internal systems and causing a cascade of malfunctions. Meanwhile, on the ground, Monoma, Takage, and Kendo hesitated a few steps away from the colossal robot. Monoma, ever the strategist, voiced his opinion. I think we should book it. It has no real points, so it won't be of much use. Plus, it might just hinder us. There's only like three more minutes left, so… A sudden scream interrupted Monoma's thoughts, emanating from the rubble in front of the zero-pointer. The trio rushed towards the source, discovering a brown-haired girl trapped beneath the debris. Concern etched Kendo's face as she inquired about the girl's well-being. I'm fine, but I can't get the rubble off me. I used my quirk too much, the girl explained. Monoma, ever curious, asked about her quirk. Zero gravity. If I touch something, then activate my quirk by linking my fingers. I erase the gravity of the object, she revealed. Monoma seized the opportunity to help, poking a bit of her arm before using his quirk to lift the rubble. As the debris floated in the air, Kendo, with determination in her eyes, decided to unveil her second quirk, given to her by All Might. Yellow and orange lightning enveloped her as she crouched and leaped into the air. Just before landing a powerful punch on the colossal robot's face, she noticed a peculiar detail. The lights on the machine dimmed and went out. The robot shut down. Before anyone could process the sudden turn of events, Kendo shouted smash. Her fist connected with the robot's face, leaving a massive dent as it toppled backward. As Kendo descended from her powerful leap, a realization struck her. How would she land? A few meters above the pavement, she felt a gentle tug on her clothes. Birds, a mix of crows, pigeons, and an unfamiliar small species, had come to her aid. They stopped her fall before releasing her just centimeters above the ground. With her feet safely on the ground, the avian saviors scattered into the surrounding mock city, disappearing from view. The unexpected alliance between the examinees and the avian helpers marked the end of the UA entrance exam's final part, leaving questions and anticipations lingering in the air. In the observer's booth, a collective sigh of relief echoed through the air. The zero-pointer, having lost control for an unknown reason, did not shut down after it was freed. All Might, now in his buffed form, stood on the brink of leaping into action, his pride swelling in his chest as his chosen successor, Kendo Itsuka, emerged victorious and averted a potential disaster. As the tension subsided, the focus shifted to the upcoming class assignments for the students who had successfully navigated the challenging entrance exam. Twenty coveted seats awaited the chosen ones and discussions buzzed among the teachers from both Class 1A and Class 1B. Eraserhead, contemplating the placement of Midoriya Izuku, voiced his opinion to Vlad King. I think he should be in my class. Present Mike, chiming in with support, added, The kid wrote Underground Hero on the questions about merch and corporation. I believe it's best if he joins 1A, especially since Eraserhead is an underground hero himself. Vlad King considered the proposal. I can vouch for that. But I'll need a student from your class in exchange. Hum Kendo Itsuka. She seems to be friends with two of the students in your class, Eraserhead suggested. I can accept that, Vlad King agreed. With a nod between the teachers, the decision was made. Well then, it's official. These examinees are hereby students, Principal Nezu declared as he clicked a button, sealing the fate of the successful candidate. All Might, 
Though still harboring some skepticism about Midoriya's ability to navigate hero work without a quirk, held his reservations. He knew the principal's decisions were well thought out, and Nezu's intricate understanding of the student's potential far surpassed his own. As the gears of UAS academic machinery began to turn, the chosen students prepared to embark on their heroic journeys, each with a unique set of skills and a destiny intertwined with the prestigious institution. Izuku stood outside the imposing gates of Yue, clad in his distinctive military-like uniform, garnering a few curious glances from passers-by. Unfazed by the attention, he couldn't shake the nerves that accompanied the uncertainty of whether he had passed the entrance exam. Nonetheless, he held on to the hope that his impressive 71 points would secure his place. As he pondered his fate, a familiar, feminine voice called out, breaking his reverie. Turning to the source, he found Kendo and Monoma approaching. Kendo's teasing remark about him potentially ditching them earned a chuckle from Izuku. They exchanged a few words, swapped contact numbers, and then Izuku heard a distinct toot. An ink black Daimler Regency waited nearby, ready to ferry its passenger. Looks like I need to go. My uncle's here, Izuku explained. Kendo whistled appreciatively, commenting on the car's apparent opulence. Yep, he's the owner of a weapons store. Some of his customers are private militaries for hire. You'd be surprised how much money you make out of that. Izuku replied casually, hinting at the unconventional nature of his family's business. With a wave, he bid farewell to his newfound friends and headed towards the waiting car, the doors automatically opening for him. As he settled into the luxurious interior, the Daimler Regency glided away from the school gates, leaving behind the bustling campus and a curious crowd. Izuku's journey at UA had just begun, and the mysteries surrounding him seemed to deepen with each passing moment. As Izuku settled into the plush interior of the Daimler Regency, the enigmatic entity, Gaimai, which inhabited his mind, took control of the conversation. So, how'd it go? Gaimai inquired, steering the conversation toward the recent events at UA. Pretty well, I think. So what now? Izuku questioned, his curiosity evident. Gaimai's response was cryptic. Well, you continue your years at UA until you pass or... Or what? Izuku probed, sensing an ominous undercurrent in Gaimai's words. Gaimai's next statement sent a chill down Izuku's spine. You help me overthrow the government. Wait, what? Why would I do that? Izuku exclaimed in surprise, the notion seeming preposterous. I'll explain once we get to well, when we get to our destination. You better know that you'll be learning about a grudge that has been growing since 2154, Gaimai revealed, adding an air of mystery and urgency to their impending conversation. The car continued its smooth journey, carrying Izuku toward a destination that held not only the promise of education at UA but also the revelation of a long-standing vendetta that would shape his destiny in unforeseen ways. In the dimly lit warehouse filled with an array of weaponry, Izuku found himself seated across from Gaimai. Crates surrounding them contained a myriad of weapons, each holding its own tale of history and conflict. Gaimai began, So, are you familiar with the NCC? Izuku shook his head in response. Expected that. So, for basics, the NCC was an emergency unit in the Japanese government that evolved into a military force of its own. However, after the court collapse, the Hero Public Safety Commission was formed. Now, this isn't very special on its own, but in 2154, a member of the NCC found out that the then-president of the HPSC had made a deal with a villain, a very dangerous villain, which is basically treason. However, the HPSC made it look like it was the NCC who had committed these crimes, and so the National Crisis Committee was disbanded. That's where it ends or where they think it ends. Gaimai reached for a map and unfolded it revealing a giant representation of a territory labeled NCC. It covered the entirety of Siberia and Korea, parts of China and Mongolia. Russia and China were split into multiple borders, each outlined in gray, while the NCC territory was marked in an ominous ink black. Puppet states. Those things are puppet states, balkanized. While the whole of Earth doesn't know it, this place has been in the making for more than 200 years, with yours truly at its head. You see, while I was trapped in that forest for 15 years, I didn't sit around in silence. I made my soul, which could go through the barrier and take over someone else's body. I met some exiled members of the National Crisis Committee and took them in. They're all dead, of course, having passed away somewhere between 2170 to 2180. But when they died, I took control. I've been holding them there for now. The weight of Gaimai's revelation hung in the air, unveiling a history that stretched beyond centuries, with the entity at the center of a clandestine plan that defied time itself. But I'm not too sure about my first plan, though, Gaimai admitted, prompting Izuku to inquire further, and that was, to just bomb Japan to rubble and ash. But I don't think I would like that. Hem Gaimai contemplated, pondering alternative courses of action. Well, I'll tell you this. I'll hold off on invading Japan for now and we'll just go deal with Belarus. Having some more puppets never does any harm. 
But there's been a rise in criminal activity in Japan. Someone is preparing something, Gaimai divulged, shifting the focus to the growing unrest in Japan. Meanwhile, a tall man sat in a metallic chair surrounded by a life support system, feeling the urge to sneeze. Back in the warehouse, Gaimai continued, So what I think is that once criminal activity spikes, I'll send in some troops in the confusion, and fight both sides how about that? And if you still don't like it, do you think the HPSC are a good influence on hero society? The proposal hung in the air, leaving Izuku to grapple with the weight of Gaimai's intentions and the implications of his own choices. The conversation delved into the complexities of power, morality, and the blurred lines between heroism and villainy as Izuku found himself navigating a path fraught with uncertainty and moral ambiguity. But what about the casualties? Izuku questioned, expressing concern for the potential loss of innocent lives. In war, there will always be death, people caught in a crossfire, Gaimai responded coldly. I'll tell you this, the HPSC has killed more people than 16 years of civil war in Japan. So seeing that the protectors have killed more than a civil war, I believe they should be gotten rid of oh, excuse me, the National Crisis Committee wants them gone. I could care less, it's the chaos I'm after. But that doesn't matter, see them as a helping hand in the future. There is a war coming, maybe it will take a few years, but something is coming and better to have a fighting force ready in case. The ominous declaration hung in the air, emphasizing the impending conflict and the ruthlessness of those vying for power. Izuku grappled with the weight of the decision ahead, torn between his desire for a heroically just world and the grim reality of the choices presented to him. The path ahead seemed clouded with uncertainty, and the echoes of war loomed on the horizon. The Black Daimler Regency smoothly pulled up to Izuku's destination, the apartment complex standing tall against the cityscape. The rhythmic hum of the engine ceased as Gaimai brought the car to a stop, and silence enveloped them. The radio, playing some random song, provided a distant backdrop to the moment. Izuku stepped out of the car, the military-like uniform still clinging to him, and closed the door with a solid thud. The night air carried a cool breeze, a stark contrast to the weighty conversation that lingered between them during the drive. As he faced Gaimai, uncertainty clouded his expression. Well, here is your destination, Gaimai remarked, breaking the silence. Also, I suggest raising the ranks of your animal army to 900 now. The more, the merrier, they say. Don't worry about food, they don't need it. The only thing the animals we summon with Animal Summoner can do is follow the orders of its master. Izuku nodded in acknowledgement, his mind processing the new information. I'll keep that in mind, he replied, a hint of determination in his voice. As Gaimai prepared to leave, the apartment complex's entrance loomed in the background. The cityscape behind Izuku held a mix of artificial and natural lights, creating an atmosphere that mirrored the conflicting emotions within him. The journey home had taken an unexpected turn, unveiling a clandestine world and a role Izuku never envisioned. The car door closed with a soft thud, and the Daimler Regency gracefully departed into the night, leaving Izuku standing at the threshold of his complex. The weight of responsibility settled on his shoulders, and as he ascended the steps, the path ahead seemed both challenging and uncertain. The echoes of Gaimai's plans for chaos and war lingered, and Izuku couldn't escape the realization that he was now entangled in a destiny far more complex than he had ever imagined. Corporal Andridge C. Verbulize and Private Stanislav Liepa, both from Latvian origin, patrolled the base they called home, Fort Sokol, nestled in what used to be Russia but was now part of NCC territory. They traversed the grounds, passing by the imposing sniper tower, and greeted their replacements, a Russian soldier and one from China, as they prepared to end their patrol duty. Back at the barracks, they exchanged their military gear for sleeping clothes, settling into their bunk beds amidst the diverse group of soldiers from various nations occupying Fort Sokol. The camaraderie among them spoke of the bonds forged in the face of uncertainty and distance from their homelands. The next day dawned early, and Company 4 of Division Spine assembled for roll call, Major Yijin Chai addressing the 250 soldiers with authority. Standing beside him was a figure draped in a black military trench coat, an insignia denoting his rank as General Director, a title reserved for times of crisis. The General Director, with tar-black skin and eyes like voids, stepped forward to address the soldiers. His voice carried an eerie weight, and silence fell among the ranks as he outlined his plans for a covert operation in Japan, specifically the Kagoshima Prefecture. I hope you like it here. The General Director began, his words tinged with an unknown foreboding. Now then, do you know why I am here? His question hung in the air, met with silence from the soldiers. With a chuckle, he continued, unveiling his intentions for the operation and the need for thirty volunteers from Division Spine. Andridge listened intently, knowing that his fate, like that of his comrades, rested on the choice to volunteer or remain behind. As the general director departed, leaving the soldiers to ponder their decision, Andridge couldn't help but feel the weight of uncertainty settle upon him. 
The day unfolded with the weight of impending decisions. As the soldiers grappled with the call to serve in a distant land, far from the familiarity of Fort Sokol. In the quiet moments that followed, amidst the routine of military life, Andrej knew that regardless of his choice, the path ahead held challenges and sacrifices yet to be revealed. And as the day waned, the echoes of the general director's words lingered, casting a shadow of doubt over the barracks of Fort Sokol. Meanwhile, asleep at his desk, Izuku Midoriya had spent the entire night delving into the mysteries surrounding the NCC. Frustration had clouded his initial attempts to find relevant information in Japanese sources, but a stroke of insight led him to switch his VPN to foreign servers. It was there that he uncovered a trove of details on Informatica, considered the successor of Wikipedia. The page chronicled the formation of the NCC in 1940, its role as an emergency unit, and subsequent disbandment, highlighting leaders, divisions, and branches. Amidst the vast array of information, a particular entry captured Izuku's attention, the position of general director. The name attached to this title was Klaus Krob, a surname he recognized from Gaimai's fabricated identity. Further research led Izuku to explore the Hirogenes database, a tool used to trace familial ties to heroes. He entered the last name Krob alongside Klaus and uncovered profiles from 1913 to 1956. Intriguingly, certain documents had endured the quirk collapse, revealing the history of Klaus Wittold Friedhelm Krob. The record unfolded as follows. Full name, Klaus Wittold Friedhelm Krob. Date of birth, 509-2091. Date of death, 8-12-21-35. Place of birth, Kapis, Germany. Place of death, Somatic, Indonesia. Nationality, German, Polish. Occupation, first general director of the National Crisis Committee. Mother's name, Dorota C.H. Meal. Father's name, Gregor Krob. Wife's name, Miho Yuno. Children, two. Sons, one. Daughter, one. The discovery left Izuku with a web of questions. Klaus Krob's connections to Gaimai's fabricated identity hinted at a deeper link, a puzzle piece waiting to be unveiled. As daylight began to filter into the room, Izuku contemplated the implications of this newfound knowledge, sensing that the path he treaded was leading him to a nexus of hidden truths and intertwined destinies. Izuku remained seated within the recesses of his own mind the ethereal space where Gaimai had imparted knowledge on manipulating the mental landscape. Here, the oak forest retained its familiar presence, albeit now populated by lifeless doppelgangers scattered amidst the trees. These were not real individuals but mere constructs of Izuku's imagination, crafted for a singular purpose, training. In his hands, Izuku conjured a glaive, its gleaming blade reflecting a spectral light. The air was charged with anticipation as Izuku took a defensive stance, eyes focused on the surroundings. Among the training dummies, one armed with a Tao attempted a stealthy approach. However, Izuku, attuned to the nuances of his mental realm, heard the subtle footfalls. With preternatural reflexes, he swiftly evaded the sneak attack, maneuvering with grace. The glaive in his hands became an extension of his intent as he struck decisively, impaling the would-be assailant. A deft twist of the weapon followed, dislodging the dummy, and with a strategic kick, Izuku sent it tumbling away through the imaginary foliage. As the silent forest echoed with the phantom clash of metal and the muted thuds of defeated training dummies, Izuku continued honing his skills. The mental landscape served as a canvas for his growth, each confrontation within his own psyche a stepping stone toward mastering the unique abilities bestowed upon him by the enigmatic Gaimai. After hours of intense training within his mental realm, Izuku stood amidst the aftermath. The field was strewn with the lifeless training dummies, and scavenger birds, drawn from the shadowy depths of his mind, had already begun their feast. With a spadroon in hand, he surveyed the results of his relentless practice, having defeated 52 dummies in a display of skill and precision. Seating himself under the comforting shade of one of the numerous oak trees that adorned his mental landscape, Izuku placed the spadroon on the ground, watching it dematerialize. Closing his eyes, he immersed himself in a moment of calm reflection. When he reopened them, he found himself back in the reality of his bedroom, morning sunlight filtering through the curtains. Routine tasks followed, a shower, teeth brushing, and a change into casual attire. As he anticipated the letter from Yue, signaling the approaching end of summer vacation, Izuku knew he had three more days of wait ahead. A message on his phone interrupted his thoughts, revealing a newly formed group chat initiated by Itsuka Kendo. The members included Nito Monoma, Satsuna Takage, and Achako Yuraraka, familiar faces from the exam. Monoma, true to form, had shared another self-made meme, asserting his supposed superiority, with Kendo responding using a facepalm emoji. The banter within the chat provided a light moment amid the anticipation for the next phase of their journey at UA. Meanwhile, Gaimai strolled through the silent scrapyard, a recent acquisition of his. Though officially closed for years, it served as a convenient front for some less-than-legal activity. 
With a legal identity secured, Gaimai could now indulge in such endeavors without the need for elaborate cover-ups. The small house within the yard had only three rooms, a bathroom, a compact kitchen, and a modest office. Entering the office, Gaimai placed two logbooks on the desk, one of which he opened and perused. The other found a secure spot in a hidden safe beneath the desk. From a drawer, he materialized a baluster, Molina pistol, securing it carefully. His attention shifted as the distant rumble of an approaching truck echoed through the yard. A shipment of decommissioned cars awaited. The driver, upon arrival, stepped into the office. Where from? Gaimai inquired. Listenberg. The driver replied calmly. Gaimai rose, motioning for the driver to follow him. They entered the small kitchen, where a hatch in the ground revealed a concealed room, bathed in light and stocked with an array of weapons. Choose your pick. If you don't find anything noteworthy, I have a book filled with weapons for you to peruse, Gaimai offered. The driver nodded and began to explore the collection. After a few minutes, he halted and declared, 12 of these will do. He had selected an M26 mass shotgun. Gaimai smirked. Well then, let's finalize the deal. 12 of those will be 6 grand. In his office, Gaimai sat amidst the silence, surrounded by the remnants of transactions past. The air hung heavy with the scent of old metal and disused machinery. His attention focused on a briefcase, the contents of which amounted to a tidy sum of 10 grand. The last customer, a dealer in scrap appliances, had utilized the covert code, Listenberg. The reference was a nod to times long past, a joke born in an era when humor seemed simpler. Few recognized the term, but it served its purpose as a discreet signal for those seeking something beyond the realm of legality. In exchange for a collection of broken-down washing machines and toasters, the previous customer had walked away with two AA-52 machine guns. Closing the briefcase, Gaimai tucked it away beneath the desk. Its contents would soon be converted into gold, a timeless investment strategy passed down from the father of a host he had occupied in the early 2020 seconds. The man had stressed the importance of gold, emphasizing its immunity to the pitfalls of inflation and counterfeiting. Though quirks existed, capable of bestowing Amida's touch upon their wielders, the criminal underworld operated discreetly, shielding such individuals from the prying eyes of authority. And so, gold remained a secure and reliable asset in Gaimai's financial portfolio. As Gaimai calmly surveyed the scrapyard from his office window, he was met with an unexpected disruption. A loud crash shattered the stillness, prompting him to turn his gaze toward the source. The once-empty scrapyard now resembled Tacoba Municipal Beach Park, filled with life and bustling activity. Birds from Izuku's vast avian army patrolled the area, maintaining a watchful eye on the surroundings. The scrapyard's strategic location on the outskirts of Musutafu, adjacent to the Night District, was a calculated move. Rundown businesses in the area provided a convenient cover for Gaimai's clandestine activities, a realm of illegal arms dealings and covert transactions. Despite the unexpected influx of activity, Gaimai had yet to visit the headquarters of Izuku's bird army. Pigeons had discreetly observed him adding an extra layer of surveillance to his operation. Positioned on the edge of the city, his base remained inconspicuous amid the neglected structures of the night district. As the crash echoed through the scrapyard, Gaimai decided to investigate. He reached for a pistol tucked away in a drawer, securing it in the pocket of his revamped attire. His new ensemble consisted of a black blazer, red tie, white shirt, black pants, leather shoes, and a stylish black borsalino hat, a change from his previous military-like uniform. Stepping outside, Gaimai sought the cause of the disturbance. What he hadn't anticipated, however, was the sight of a pink-haired girl clad in blue overalls, covered in soot and immersed in the inner workings of a rusty old car. Gaimai cleared his throat, a polite attempt to draw the attention of the pink-haired girl immersed in her work. Excuse me, miss, but what are you doing? His words seemed to startle her, causing her to swiftly turn around, tool in hand. Oops, sorry, didn't mean to startle you, but you're kinda. Well, in my scrapyard, Gaimai explained, wearing a convincing expression of mild concern. As if a realization struck her, Mei Hatsum's face lit up with a bright smile. In an instant, she moved to the front of Gaimai, enthusiastically shaking his hand. Hi, I'm Mei Hatsum, but just call me Mei. Gaimai was immediately struck by the girl's exuberant demeanor, finding it somewhat unusual for a Japanese citizen to be so casually friendly. Nonetheless, he decided to go along with it. Nice to meet you, Mei. I'm Gaimai Krob, but just call me Gaimai, I guess. Now, could you explain what you're doing? Mei's response intrigued and puzzled him simultaneously. Well, I want to be a future support designer, and so I'm trying to find spare parts for my babies. She explained, producing goggles from her pocket. The notion of calling inventions babies raised an eyebrow from Gaimai. Didn't know people so young had children, he remarked, to which Mei promptly shook her head. Not those babies. These babies, she clarified, displaying the goggles. And, oh, you call your inventions babies? Yep, I mean, they're always so cute, and seeing how I create them, like babies, so they're my babies. 
Mei cheerfully elaborated, showcasing her unique perspective on her creations. Gai Mai decided to let the peculiar logic slide for now. Still doesn't explain what you're doing here, though. Well, I'm searching for scrap parts. You see, I got accepted to the support course at UA, and so I think I should look around in Musutafu to see if I have any supplies in case needed. I already went to this beach, but it was filled with birds, so I left it alone, May explained, providing context to her presence in the scrapyard. Ah, uh, well, alright. I don't really lose money to this, but could you tell me on which days you will come over to search the yard? Daimai inquired politely. May, picking up on the formality, beamed at him. I would mostly come when I don't have school, so weekends and when school has finished. Is that all right with you? Of course, just when you do this somewhere else, be sure to warn the owners of the scrapyard. Well, I'm inside that small house over there. Also, there will be some shipments of faulty factory equipment, so watch out you don't get run over by a truck, guy my caution. May, now sporting her goggles and a smile, responded with determination, will do. Before returning to the task of stripping the car for spare parts, Gaimai just hummed, turned around, and made his way back to his office. Gaimai, settling in his office, fired up his computer. With precision, he meticulously filled out an application to establish a conglomerate. He then listed all the businesses he had acquired. Three scrapyards, twelve bars, two clothing stores, five retail stores, a small supermarket, and a maintenance store. Strategically, he transferred the two clothing stores to Krob Weapons Industries, intending to sell military clothing. Creating Rosenfeld Scrap Dealers, he placed the three scrapyards under its umbrella. Both KWI and RSD were then organized under the newly established Eagle Incorporate. The remaining retail stores, small supermarket, and maintenance store were bundled under Badger Everyday Store, another addition to the Eagle Incorporated family. As for the bars, Gaimai decided to let them remain independent, allowing them to flourish. His immediate plans included expanding into additional, less affluent districts of Musutafu. Gaimai's decision to establish and organize his businesses under a conglomerate had its roots in practicality. He had lost all his previous savings when his last host died, leading to the collapse of both his criminal and legal ventures. In a bid to rebuild, he opted for a fresh start. The capital generated from these various enterprises would primarily be invested in accumulating gold. This precious metal held intrinsic value, and Gaimai recalled the advice from his host in the 2020 seconds about its stability. The gold reserve would serve as a means of funding the NCC sleeper cell he was assembling in Kagoshima, ensuring that the financial transactions remained discreet and undetected. The meticulous planning was a testament to Gaimai's experience, and he acknowledged the influence of the kid from the 2020 seconds in shaping his approach. The chosen names and strategies were a nod to the past. Even though most of those connections were severed with the demise of his last host, Gaimai continued his strategic expansion eyeing potential properties in the nearby warehouse district. This district, marked by its dual identity as part industry and part dockyard, seemed promising for his future endeavors. He scoured listings for suitable warehouses to house his growing inventory, a vital component for his various businesses. Among the opportunities he discovered was an out-of-business scrap yard. Recognizing the potential value in repurposing such a location, Gaimai added it to his growing list of acquisitions. The warehouse district presented a fresh frontier for his operations and Gaimai was keen on establishing a strong presence there. The calculated moves aimed to bolster his conglomerate and ensure a steady stream of resources for his clandestine activity. Gaimai, after finishing his corporate activities for the day, shifted his focus to a different kind of business, one involving the removal of certain obstacles in his path. Flipping through his logbook, he located a record of a group that had threatened him in the past, realizing that their presence could disrupt the delicate balance he sought. He decided it was time to eliminate the potential problem. Picking up a burner phone, he dialed a number that would set things into motion. On the other end of the line was Jiren, a notorious figure in the underworld. Gaimai, despite being a newcomer to this particular era, knew how to navigate the criminal landscape. Hello Jiren. Yeah, you don't know me, I know. Gaimai smoothly began the conversation, playing his part as a discreet client seeking services. Listen, I need some mercs, and I'll give a pretty penny for it too. Could you do that for me? A brief negotiation followed, sealing the deal at 20 grand, 10 up front and 10 after the job was done. With a simple we got a deal. Great, Gaimai closed the conversation. He promptly crushed the burner phone between his hands, ready to set in motion the chaos he intended to orchestrate for his amusement. The promise of entertainment was his driving force in this endeavor, aligning with the underlying motivations that fueled his actions. As Izuku pondered the recent developments and the mysterious actions of Gaimai, he couldn't shake the feeling of unease that lingered in the air. The camper, once a place of solace, now seemed filled with uncertainty. 
He watched as the crows perched nearby, a silent audience to the unfolding events. Today was the day the letter from Yue would typically arrive, a beacon of hope amidst the chaos that surrounded him. Despite the odds stacked against him, Izuku held on to the belief that this letter would signify a turning point, a chance to forge his path as a hero. But Gaimai's recent activities cast a shadow of doubt over Izuku's hopes. The creation of a conglomerate, dealings with mercenaries, it all hinted at a darker agenda lurking beneath the surface. Yet, Izuku hesitated to take action. Reporting Gaimai's actions to the authorities felt futile, given the magnitude of the situation and the mysterious entity's power. In the midst of uncertainty, Izuku resolved to remain vigilant. He would continue to monitor Gaimai's movements, striving to decipher the entity's intentions while safeguarding his own. As the crows rested around him, Izuku awaited the arrival of the letter, a beacon of hope in a world teetering on the edge of darkness. The room was dimly lit, shadows dancing across Gaimai's face as he addressed the four mercenaries. Ta, Phobos, Teshub, and Enias, a formidable team assembled for a dark mission. Gaimai's white irises pierced through the darkness as he delved into the details of their task. If I'm correct, you are looking for a job, Gaimai began, his tone laced with a calculated confidence. Aeneas, the only one to respond, cut to the chase. Correct, now tell us what to do and how much we get for it. We're not here to chit-chat. A sly smirk formed on Gaimai's face as he outlined the mission. There is this small extortion group in Musutafu. They've been a pain in the ass for a bit. What I need you for to do is eliminate three of their members. With a swift motion, he placed three files on the desk, each containing information on a target. Janichi Takuchi, codename Ender. He's the advisor to the leader of the group and his brother. You'll find him at a cafe in the Western District most of the time, Nico's Coffee Shop. Second, Atsushi Takuchi, codename Pure. He's the son of the leader and oversees some rackets. Third and last, Shikairo Takuchi, codename Seven. Another brother of the leader, overseeing some of the group's extortion rackets. You'll find both Atsushi and Shikairo somewhere in the warehouse looking through some merchandise, mostly opium, but some other things as well. Gaimai leaned back, his eyes still fixed on the mercenaries. Now, the payment is 40 grand, 10 grand each. How does that sound? The room fell silent. The mercenaries contemplating the task ahead and the tempting reward offered by the enigmatic Gaimai Krop. Enias responded, her tone unyielding. If it will be raised to 60 grand, then we'll do it. Gaimai's expression shifted, his smirk fading into a darker visage. Hmm, of course, I'll do that. How do you want it paid? Teshub, another of the mercenaries, spoke, wireless transfer, it can neither be traced back to us or you. Gaimai's smirk returned, now tinged with a subtle malice. I can do that. Now then, I don't care how you do it. All I want is to have these three dead by the end of the week. Enias joined in with her own polite smile, and Gaimai understood the significance of her codename. It might not be affecting him, but he knew its historical context. Well then, I guess we have a deal. With that, Enias and her group exited the office and the scrapyard, leaving behind an air of ominous agreement that hung heavily in the room. The darkness of the office seemed to linger, concealing the secrets that transpired within its confines. A new phone materialized in Gaimai's hand. He contacted a number saved only as the profiler, and as it connected, he spoke briskly. Collins, you hear me? Great. Now I want four profiles about four mercs, Ta, Phobos, Teshub, and Enias. Yep, could you do that for me? What? Family, real names, anything that can be exploited, really? All right, then. I'll see you soon. With that, Gaimai ended the call, his mind already churning with plans and possibilities. The profiler, known for his meticulous research and deep understanding of the criminal underworld, would provide the necessary information to exploit the weaknesses of these mercenaries. Gaimai took a thoughtful drag of his pipe as he watched Mei work diligently on removing parts from an automated wrapper in the scrapyard. The sunlight streamed in through the open curtains, casting a warm glow over the room. His mind buzzed with plans, and a new idea began to take shape. There were still more members of the Takuchi clan to contend with, nine in total, including Akiro Takuchi himself. Akiro had five sons, three daughters, seven cousins, and various other relatives deeply entrenched in the family business. Shin Takuchi, the patriarch and founder of the clan, was still actively involved as well. However, the three targets Gaimai wanted eliminated were more personal. They had been the ones who had come knocking at his door a few days ago, causing quite a disturbance. The rest of the Takuchi clan would be dealt with in due time. But for now, Gaimai's focus remained on his immediate objectives. Izuku sat at the dinner table, his mother, and Ko, seated across from him. Gaimai was at the side, donned in his usual scrapyard clothes rather than his general director uniform. And Ko didn't seem phased upon learning about Izuku's uncle, and dinner proceeded as usual. The aroma of yudon noodles with rice and chicken filled the air, a dish that might not have been Izuku's favorite. But when his mom made it, everything tasted delicious. In the midst of the meal, Inko initiated a conversation. 
So, you're one of Hisashi's cousins, right? Gaimai adopted a soothing tone, a skillful change of personality that showcased his adaptability. Yes, indeed. I'm one of the sons of his aunt. My father, a Flemish man, married her, and I've been living in Japan for about 12 years now. Izuku discovered our familial tie and reached out to me for help with some support items. I never really knew Hisashi had a family, as he was in love the last time I heard of him. And Ko sighed. Yes, it's a shame he had to move due to his job. Gaimai nodded in agreement, maintaining a sympathetic expression. Indeed, the demands of certain jobs can lead to such separations. But family connections persist, and I'm glad Izuku reached out to me. Inko smiled warmly, appreciative of Gaimai's support for her son. It's wonderful that family can always come together when needed. Thank you for helping Izuku. Gaimai returned the smile, his eyes showing a hint of kindness. It's my pleasure. Family should always look out for one another. As the dinner conversation continued, Izuku couldn't help but feel a mixture of gratitude and curiosity towards his newfound uncle. Gaimai, on the other hand, continued to play the role of the caring family member, concealing his true intentions beneath a facade of normalcy. The evening unfolded with familial warmth, unaware of the looming shadows that had been set in motion. Well then, I believe there is a letter to be opened, Gaimai said with an calm voice. A letter lay in the middle of the dinner table, Yue stamped on it. Izuku's hands trembled slightly as he unfolded the letter, his heart pounding with anticipation and nervousness. The contents confirmed what he had hoped for yet dreaded to know. His eyes scanned the words, revealing his scores and the confirmation of his acceptance into Yue. A mixture of relief and apprehension washed over him as he absorbed the news. Inko's tears of joy flowed freely, her heart overflowing with pride for her son's achievement. She reached out and embraced him, her emotions too profound for words. Beside them, Gaimai continued to eat his meal, his demeanor calm and collected. However, beneath his composed facade, a storm of dark intentions brewed, his plans inching forward with each passing moment. Izuku's mind buzzed with a whirlwind of thoughts and emotions. He couldn't shake the feeling of unease, sensing that his journey into Yue would be fraught with challenges and dangers beyond his imagination. But for now, in the warmth of his mother's embrace, he found solace amidst the uncertainty that lay ahead. The atmosphere in the warehouse was a mix of camaraderie and nostalgia as Elton Britt's voice crooned through the radio. The soldiers from Company 4, Division Spine, had found themselves stationed in Kagoshima, far from their homes. Andridge C. Verbulize and Stanislav Liepa, amidst their poker game, couldn't help but appreciate the familiar tunes that resonated with the hardships of military life. Adjutant Major Otto's Jokinen, known for his stoic demeanor, sat with an air of authority, observing the interactions of the soldiers under his command. First Sergeant Sebastian Bogomolov, a seasoned soldier with a weathered look, shared a quiet moment beside him. Across the table, Corporal Risto Kroon, engaged in the poker game, seemed to enjoy the brief respite from the rigors of duty. As the song continued, the soldiers found solace in the music, a connection to their shared experiences as they awaited their next orders in the distant land of Kagoshima. The rotation blues were real, but in these moments, the bonds formed between them provided a semblance of home far from the familiar landscapes of their origins. The atmosphere in the warehouse shifted as the door swung open, allowing the commanding figures of Captain Bruno Balotis and Major Yijin Chai to step inside. The resonant tones of Elton Britt's song were silenced as Captain Balotis took charge, switching off the radio to signal the beginning of a serious discussion. Men, Major Chai addressed the gathered soldiers, his authoritative voice cutting through the air. Our first objective and assignment have been given. We will have to scout different crime clans and families to see which ones will be allies and which enemies. The soldiers listened attentively, preparing for the mission that lay ahead. Major Chai continued, You are asked to adorn civilian clothing. Four squads, each led by a staff sergeant, will be formed for this mission. He then proceeded to announce the composition of each squad, assigning specific soldiers to their respective teams. Squad 1, under Staff Sergeant Boldisar Agax, consists of Corporal Risto Kroon, Corporal Daniel Weaver, Corporal Petr Adasin, and Private Stanislav Liepa. Squad 2, led by Staff Sergeant William Tarosian, includes Corporal Andrej Z. Verbulis, Corporal Yuri Kazlu, Corporal Hendrik Monagut, and Staff Sergeant William Tarosian. Major Chai meticulously detailed the assignments for Squad 3. Under Staff Sergeant Ricardas Petrades, and Squad 4, led by Staff Sergeant Marcos Vittel. Each squad had its unique mix of experienced soldiers ready to embark on the reconnaissance mission. All of the men listed are to report to the base commander. Colonel Paul Engolfson, Major Chai concluded, emphasizing the importance of the mission. The soldiers responded with a unified salute, acknowledging their orders. With that, Major Chai and Captain Belotis exited the warehouse, leaving the soldiers to prepare for their new assignments. The weight of their responsibilities hung in the air as they contemplated the challenges that awaited them in Kagoshima. 
Meanwhile, as Ta, Phobos, and Teshub observed their targets, Atsushi and Shikairo Tekuchi, who were busy counting yen in a small hut, a sense of tension lingered in the air. Ta, seated in the passenger seat, initiated the conversation, seeking confirmation about their targets. That them, Teshub, focused on the task at hand, confirmed, yep, they were very easy to trace. Phobos, the third member of the group, interjected with a hint of skepticism, anyone else thinks this is a trap. Ta, dismissing the notion, snorted, come on Anaki-sama, it's just your paranoia. Phobos blushed slightly, insisting, I told you to stop calling me that, we're not children anymore. Teshub, taking a more pragmatic stance, sighed, oh, for the love of, I'm the youngest here and the most mature at the same time. Now is not the time for playing. We're on a job. The trio refocused on the mission, setting aside any personal dynamics. The air remained charged with a sense of caution as they continued to observe their targets. It became clear that their assignment might not be as straightforward as it initially seemed, and the possibility of a trap lingered in the minds of the mercenaries. In his scrapyard office, Gaimai sat absorbed in the profiles Collins, also known as the profiler, had provided. As he perused the information, a subtle amusement played on his lips. The activation of the Black Eagle Network marked the first time in 50 years. And though many of the original members had long since passed away, Gaimai anticipated the forthcoming events. The profiles of the mercenaries intrigued him. Aeneas, or Aya Kubo, turned out to be the matriarch of a family comprising three mercenaries, Arata Kubo, or Phobos, as the eldest son, Suzumu Kubo, or Ta, as the middle child, and Saburu Kubo, or Teshub. Kaimai chuckled as he discovered that the father of the family, Hinata Kubo, was a shoe tailor with hidden depths. The four decided to embrace the life of mercenaries to settle Hinata's debts, a revelation that added an unexpected layer to their characters. Amusement colored Gaimai's thoughts as he contemplated the impending fate of the Kubo family. The Takuchi clan had grown suspicious of someone tailing them, and it wouldn't be long before the Kubo family faced a reckoning. Hanada, blissfully ignorant of the covert lives his wife and children led, was off securing a business deal in Atlanta, unaware of the impending surprise awaiting him, a financial deal that would plunge him into a depth he couldn't anticipate. Fate, with its capricious turns, played a hand in orchestrating events that Gaimai found both intriguing and capricious. Enias discreetly observed her target from a dimly lit corner of the bar. Jinichi Takuchi, a womanizer by nature, was surrounded by two adoring ladies in his booth. As she watched him, Aeneas couldn't help but feel a certain disdain for individuals like him, those who wielded their charm and influence to manipulate others for the sake of social standing and wealth. In her hierarchy of contempt, such people ranked lower than even Gaimai, the enigmatic figure who had employed her services. While her feelings toward Gaimai were tinged with a degree of ambivalence, the disdain she felt for the likes of Genichi was unambiguous. Yet, she understood the pragmatic necessity of her undertaking. Her husband, Hanada Kubo, a shoe tailor with dreams beyond his means, had unknowingly accrued a substantial debt to extricate him from financial ruin. Aeneas had accepted the mercenary lifestyle, infiltrating the dark underbelly of crime to secure the means to settle her husband's debts. It was a path she had chosen for survival, and though it led her to uncomfortable compromises, she had to remain focused on the goal. With a determined shake of her head, Aeneas pushed aside her conflicted emotions. This mission required her to approach Genichi, to play the part of a seductress in order to achieve her objectives. It was a role she had come to accept, no matter how distasteful it felt. As she rose from her secluded vantage point, Aeneas navigated through the bar's smoky ambience. Her movements calculated and purposeful. The distant hum of conversations, clinking glasses, and subdued music served as the backdrop to her mission. She approached Jenich's booth with a practiced confidence, her features concealing the inner turmoil she grappled with. Mind if I join you? She asked, her tone suggestive and inviting. Jenichi, momentarily taken aback by her sudden appearance, grinned in response. Well, well, what do we have here? Equipped, gesturing for her to take a seat, the ladies surrounding him eyed Enias with a mix of curiosity and slight hostility. As she settled into the booth, Enias embarked on a delicate dance, playing the part, engaging in conversation, and keeping her true intentions veiled beneath a facade of allure. The bar's ambience echoed with the complex interplay of motives, as Enias tread the thin line between personal distaste and the necessary steps to secure her family's future. A few hours before this, in the dimly lit office, Gaimai pondered over the crossroads he faced. The Kudo mercenaries, unwittingly headed into a trap set by the Takuchi clan, presented him with an unexpected dilemma. He contemplated the various paths laid out before him, knowing that each choice held its own consequences. A sense of detachment lingered as he evaluated his options. On one hand, he could allow the Kudo mercenaries to walk into the impending danger, possibly facing capture, torture, and an inevitable demise at the hands of the Takuchi clan. 
This, in turn, would create an opportunity for Gaimai to handle the situation with the Takuchi clan in his own way. However, as he considered the matter further, an alternative plan began to take shape. Gaimai envisioned leveraging the strength of Division Cerberus, an intelligence division he had deployed in the Chubu region. Though their primary role was surveillance and intelligence gathering, their capabilities extended far beyond. He envisioned the eradication of the Takuchi clan, a resolution to the complex situation that had unfolded. A flip phone materialized in Gaimai's hand, a relic in the era of modern smartphones. He dialed the number of a trusted ally, the man known as Watchman, or Florian Nemes, the commander of Division Cerberus. The order he issued was clear and uncompromising. Activate Order 34 on the Takuchi clan. The directive was explicit, giving the division the authority to exterminate any members of the clan they encounter. In addition to this, Gaimai tasked Division Cerberus with a rescue mission. Aya Kubo, along with her sons Arata, Suzumu, and Saburu Kubo, were to be retrieved. The order emphasized the use of force if necessary. The flip phone crunched under the pressure of Gaimai's hand, sealing the fate of those entangled in the unfolding conflict. The decision to intervene had been made, aligning the mysterious machinations of the Black Eagle Network with the unfolding events. The web of plans and counterplans continued to weave itself, driven by an entity with motives beyond mortal comprehension. Florian Nemen, the seasoned commander of Division Cerberus, reclined in his chair within the covert confines of Fort Gate, the facade known to the world as Icta Labs. His steely gaze remained fixed on the floor-to-ceiling glass case, a repository of secrets housing a button that could set into motion a sequence of events that had long been reserved for moments of utmost gravity. The recent conversation with G.D. Krob, the second incarnation, echoed in his mind. It wasn't the first time that the enigmatic general director had beckoned him into action, but this particular summons hinted at a level of urgency that demanded the full might of Division Cerberus. The shadows seemed to stir with whispered promises of clandestine endeavors, and Nemes knew that the time had come to deploy his covert operatives. With a measured precision, he retrieved a key from a secured drawer, the metallic jingle a prelude to unfolding events. The glass case harbored the key to unleashing the silent specters of Cerberus. As he turned the key, a soft mechanical click resonated in the room, and Nemen felt a palpable shift in the atmosphere. The display concealed an innocuous button, innocently waiting for the touch that would set an intricate network of covert bases into action across the Chubu region. He hesitated for a moment, his fingers hovering over the button. In the silence, memories of past operations flickered before his eyes. Faces hidden behind balclavas, the weight of FNFAL's cradled in gloved hands, and the unmistakable aura of discipline that marked his division. Now, it was time for a different deployment, a deviation from their usual uniform of grayish black. This time, the operatives would don pitch black attire, devoid of any insignia. Balaclavas and shades would shield their identities as they ventured into the unknown, ready to carry out the covert orders issued by G.D. Krop. Memes, ever the stoic commander, grabbed his own FNFAL, a weapon that had seen more shadows than daylight. The familiar heft of the firearm served as a harbinger of the impending mission. As the Hungarian commander loaded the weapon, a subtle yet undeniable sense of gravity pervaded the room. Division Cerberus, the enigmatic force birthed from the clandestine depths of the NCC, stood poised for action. The shadows, now summoned to life, awaited their call to arms in the name of an intricate game orchestrated by unseen hands. Satoshi's heart raced as he crouched behind the makeshift barricade of overturned crates, realizing that something had gone terribly wrong. The quietness of the phone on the other end, refusing to connect with Kenta, was an ominous precursor to the chaos that unfolded. He, Shikairo, Atsushi, and Masayuki had successfully handled the trio of pursuers, capturing them to extract information. The last member's capture was reported to Junichi, expecting Kenta to retrieve them. However, their expectations were shattered when instead of Kenta's familiar vehicle, three ominous armored cars rolled into view. Confusion turned to horror as a black-clad figure swung open one of the van doors and lethally fired at Itsushi, who fell lifeless to the ground. The gang's retaliation, armed with outdated Tommy guns, proved futile against the ruthless precision of the assailants wielding advanced automated battle rifles. In a desperate attempt to escape, Shikairo and Masayuki sped away in the van, leaving Satoshi and the rookies exposed to the hailstorm of bullets. The abrupt cessation of gunfire heightened the tension, replaced by a sinister ultimatum. Takuchi Satoshi, show yourself or end up like your friend here, a cold, threatening voice echoed. Caught in a dilemma, Satoshi cautiously raised his hands, emerging from his cover. The apparent invitation for surrender was a ruse, as the machine gunner perched atop an armored car unleashed a barrage of bullets, tearing Satoshi apart before he could comprehend the betrayal. The scene was a macabre dance of violence, a ruthless ambush orchestrated with precision. The consequences of underestimating their adversaries became gruesomely apparent, leaving the once-confident Takuchi clan members in shock and disarray. 
As the echoes of gunfire faded, the ominous armored cars remained, serving as a silent testament to the ruthlessness of an unknown force that had infiltrated their operation. The aftermath was a chilling reminder of the dangers that lurked in the shadows, ready to strike at the heart of the Takuchi clan. Kenta Takuchi found himself in a dimly lit bar, surrounded by the oppressive silence that contrasted sharply with the once vibrant nightlife. The barricaded interior housed Kenta and a handful of members from smaller branches of the Takuchi clan. The sudden intrusion of an unknown force had left the streets littered with the lifeless bodies of those who couldn't secure refuge inside. Initially, the bar had buzzed with the activity of its occupants, engaging in the diversions offered by an in-house casino, a testament to Kenta's contribution to the clan's revenue. However, the sense of normalcy was shattered as five armored personnel carriers rolled in, their foreboding presence an ominous prelude to the impending onslaught. Desperation etched on his face, Kenta attempted to contact Akiro, either seeking assistance or at least issuing a warning. But the cruel irony of fate denied him this lifeline. With his phone displaying the dreaded no-service message, armed with a Colt 1911, Kenta took refuge behind the bar counter, awaiting the inevitable doom that seemed to loom closer with every passing moment. The assault commenced as the invaders ruthlessly massacred the outside guards and bouncers, creating an eerie stillness that gripped the once lively establishment. A sudden explosion shattered the sturdy entrance door, and the clan members inside instinctively aimed their weapons, only to be met with a barrage of shots penetrating the walls and filling the bar with chaos. Kenta, attempting to counter the unknown assailants, rose from his cover, but a searing pain in his shoulder abruptly halted his movements. A cry of anguish escaped him as he collapsed to the ground. His son-in-law, Masami Inaba, rushed to his side, only to meet a grim fate as a bullet struck his neck, leaving him lifeless atop Kenta. In the deafening aftermath, the haunting sound of approaching footsteps resonated through the bar. Figures clad in all black attire, armed with advanced battle rifles, stepped into the dimly lit space. Their calculated movements displayed a cold efficiency as they executed any surviving clan members with ruthless precision. Two of the invaders focused their attention on Kenta, shooting him in the legs without delivering the final blow. The merciless assailants then proceeded to douse the bar with canisters of gasoline. Helpless and incapacitated, Kenta could only watch in horror as a match ignited the flammable liquid, engulfing the once thriving establishment in an inferno of death and destruction. Ryo Takuchi, despite being considered the weakest among the clan's lieutenants, always prided himself on being resourceful and cunning. His territory comprised only a small drug market, and his influence extended to a handful of men including the two sons of a distant relative, a cousin of Kenta's son-in-law, and his own son, A.I. Takuchi. A.I., who had always admired and respected his father, now lay lifeless beside him, a stark reminder of the brutality that had unfolded. As Ryo surveyed the aftermath of the sudden and merciless assault, he found himself face to face with an enigmatic figure, no distinguishable features, just an entity cloaked in an all-black uniform. Surrounding him were others similarly attired, armed with FNFAL rifles. Ryo, recognizing the firearm, couldn't help but express his fascination. Where did you get that? He inquired, his voice tinged with curiosity. One of the assailants, their voice distorted to conceal their identity, responded, Why would you like to know? Ryo, already weakened and having coughed up a bit of blood, smiled grimly. Well, I'm a bit of a gun nut. The best rifle my men and I ever got our hands on was an AGM divided by 42. The rifle in question now lay beside him, a relic of the battles they fought. So, where did you get it from? And if you're concerned about me revealing your secret, well, I'll die anyway. So what does it matter? The mysterious figure hesitated for a moment before deciding to share a glimpse of their truth. Our leader, they disclosed, can create any weapon known to man out of nothing. Ryo, despite his imminent demise, couldn't help but hum an acknowledgement. Well, guess that's a very useful quirk, huh? He mused. With that, Ryo Takuchi uttered his final words as he drew his last breath, leaving behind a scene of death and destruction in his small territory. Yumseki's life had been a testament to struggle and hardship, born into a family marred by debt and violence. Her father, Yasuk Seki, toiled endlessly as a dock worker while her mother, Chizuru Seki, squandered their earnings on gambling at the Sunshine Casino, accruing a hefty debt owed to none other than the Takuchi clan, a prominent force in the Night District. Yasuk's efforts to repay the debt only led him to an early grave leaving Yume and her mother at the mercy of the clan's influence. Her mother's new beau, Hideo Takuchi, subjected Yume to relentless abuse, but when Yuki Takuchi, a patriarch of the clan, discovered the maltreatment, Hideo faced consequences. However, Yume's relief was short-lived as she soon found herself coerced into a nightmarish existence by Kid Takuchi, another son of Yuki. Enduring unspeakable horrors night after night, Yume's spirit waned as she silently sobbed, fearing repercussions if she dared to make a sound. As the chaos of Yuki Takuchi's birthday celebration engulfed the lower floors of the mansion, Yume remained trapped in her torment, 
the cries of revelry and gunfire echoing ominously through the halls. Suddenly, the cacophony subsided, replaced by the chilling sound of boots ascending the staircase, accompanied by more gunfire and screams. Then, the door was breached, and a figure clad in black stood before her, his weapon aimed but his gaze merciful. In broken Japanese, he inquired about her allegiance to the Takuchi family, to which Yum vehemently denied any association. With a report to his comrades, the masked man approached her, liberating her from the chains that bound her to the bed. With a directive to flee, he assured her safety as he ushered her toward the exit. Descending the stairs, Yum bore witness to the aftermath of the bloodshed, the lifeless bodies of Takuchi clan members strewn across the mansion. Amidst the carnage, a sea of armored vehicles and operatives obscured her path to freedom. Summoning her courage, she approached one of the operatives, beseeching assistance as a survivor of captivity. The man, devoid of a ski mask, regarded her with a discerning eye, eliciting her name and circumstances. Seki Yum, she murmured, her voice quivering with trepidation. Recognizing her plight, he offered sanctuary at a place called Ikta Labs, promising guidance and protection under their orders. As Yum cast a final glance at the smoldering ruins of the mansion, engulfed in flames at the behest of the operatives, she embarked on a journey toward an uncertain future, her fate now intertwined with those who had liberated her from the clutches of despair. In the dimly lit cabin of the van, Masayuki grappled with a swirl of emotions, haunted by the recent events that had unfolded. The trio of captured mercenaries lay in the back, blissfully unaware in their unconscious slumber. Beside him, Shikairo, his older brother, navigated the winding roads, their escape marred by the relentless pursuit of an ink black BMW 32 OCS, an ominous shadow in their rearview mirror. Satoshi's fate lingered in Masayuki's thoughts, a silent prayer echoing for his brother's safety amidst the chaos that had unfolded at the forest massacre. The loss of Atsushi, his nephew, hung heavy in the air, a somber reality that Shikairo voiced with a venomous curse directed at their persistent pursuer. As the van sped through a sharp right turn, Masayuki's hopes for Satoshi's well-being intensified. However, the persistent BMW 32 OCS continued its relentless pursuit, a looming specter in their escape plan. Shikairo, determined to shake off their pursuers, executed a sharp left turn, unaware of the black and armored BMW X4 that closed in from behind. With a sudden impact, the BMW X4 collided with the rear of the van, sending Shikairo hurtling through the windshield with a sickening crunch. Masayuki, battered but conscious, found himself pinned in the wreckage, the twisted metal blocking his exit. The trio of mercenaries, previously dormant, were jolted awake by the collision. From the BMW X4 emerged four enigmatic figures, clad in black, their identities concealed. Swiftly, they opened the van's trunk, extracting the unconscious mercenaries and ushering them into another waiting vehicle, an ominous app that seemed to materialize from the shadows. The process unfolded with an eerie efficiency, leaving Masayuki unable to intervene. As the BMW 32 OCS, driven by the relentless pursuers, sped away with a vengeance, the BMW X4 slowly retreated. One of the masked men disembarked, a malevolent figure against the backdrop of the unfolding tragedy. In a cruel twist of fate, he tossed a hand grenade at the compromised van. The explosive device landed at Masayuki's feet, the impending doom leaving him with nothing but a curse on his lips and a sense of resigned helplessness in the face of an uncertain fate. In the dimly lit confines of the little cat, Haruki and Kazuki Takuchi reveled in the debauchery of the Sujita-controlled establishment. The atmosphere, tainted by power dynamics and strained alliances, was underscored by the presence of Tsube Moriyama, a captive from the smaller Moriyama clan. Haruki, the younger of the two brothers, held her in a vice grip, her attempts to resist futile against his overpowering strength. Meanwhile, Kazuki engaged in conversation with Mitsuaki Sujita, the head of the club and the second eldest son of the Sujita clan's leader. The little cat served as a symbolic ground for the uneasy alliance between the Sujita and Takuchi clans, a delicate balance maintained through a complex web of power dynamics. Unbeknownst to them, two nondescript figures entered the club, seeking out Haruki and Kazuki. After obtaining their location from a Sujita member, the mysterious duo departed, setting in motion a sequence of events that would shatter the fragile peace between the clans. As the night unfolded, a fleet of five BTR-60 petabytes M Duns descended upon the scene, parking strategically nearby, patiently waiting. The armored vehicles became silent harbingers of impending chaos. When the moment struck, a calculated assault unfolded. A group of masked men, numbering between 20 to 30, stormed the club with ruthless efficiency. Bullets pierced the air, cutting down Sujita and Takuchi members indiscriminately. The chaos spared no one, even Kazuki, attempting to escape the office, met a swift demise with a bullet to the head. Mitsuaki Sujita, bravely attempting to defend his turf, found himself incapacitated with a leg wound. Disarmed and helpless, he became a prisoner of the masked assailants. A bag was forcefully placed over his head, marking the beginning of his journey into captivity. 
In the seedy back rooms, Haruki was abruptly interrupted. Thrown off Tsubame, he faced a violent assault that rendered him unconscious. Unbeknownst to him, Tsubame, traumatized by the unfolding horror, was escorted away from the blood-soaked scene and into a black mercury Monterey. As the car whisked Tsubame to an uncertain fate, Mitsuaki Sujita was brought to his knees before the club entrance. The ominous execution followed swiftly, marking the end of his reign. Haruki, still unconscious, was loaded into a Hunter TR-12, leaving the decimated club behind. With a chilling finality, the BTR-60 petabytes M. Dunas carried out their grim task. Machine gun fire tore through the night, leaving the once infamous The Little Cat in ruins, a testament to the swift and brutal upheaval that had befallen the Sujita and Takuchi clans. Tatsuya stood sentinel like atop the water tower, casting his gaze over the sprawling expanse of the night district below. It was a domain ruled by three formidable clans. The Uchimura in the west, the Sujita in the middle, and the Takuchi, to which he belonged, in the east, as the flames licked the skyline. An ominous portent of downfall, Tatsuya knew that the era of their dominance was drawing to a close. He had made a difficult decision, leaving his loyal men behind to aid Akiro, the patriarch of their clan. Tatsuya's unique quirk, familial tay, bestowed upon him the ability to sense the souls of his kin, his brothers, parents, and all those connected by blood. Earlier, he had felt the abrupt extinguishment of some of those souls, a grim testament to the bloodshed that had unfolded. As he stood in silent contemplation, the solitary sound of a car echoed in the night, followed by footsteps ascending the ladder to the water tower. Tatsuya turned, facing the two individuals who had come for him, his lone request tinged with resignation. Before you end my life, may I know who you are? He inquired, his voice tinged with a mix of curiosity and acceptance. The man, devoid of any mask or disguise, responded with clarity. Florian Neman, he stated matter-of-factly, a name that held no recognition in Tatsuya's consciousness. We're not a clan, Neman clarified, his tone somber and resolute. We're part of a military organization, tasked with executing Order 34, a directive to eliminate members of specific criminal groups. Tatsuya absorbed the revelation, his gaze turning inward as he processed the gravity of the situation. With a resigned nod, he turned away, accepting his fate with a sense of calm resolve. Neman's hand tightened around his pistol, the sleek Beretta M9 gleaming in the moonlight. In that fleeting moment, Tatsuya found solace in a memory of his younger brother, Ryo, sharing stories of firearms. His thoughts lingered briefly on Ryo's peaceful departure, a stark contrast to the violence that surrounded them. It was a privilege to converse with you, Florian Neman, Tatsuya remarked softly, his voice carrying an undertone of serenity amidst the chaos. Neman's response was brief, devoid of sentiment, as the air filled with a single, decisive gunshot. Tatsuya felt only a faint sting as the bullet pierced his skull, bringing an end to his existence atop the water tower, his soul joining the chorus of those lost to the night. Hiroshi Takuchi ran for his life, his heart pounding with the rhythm of panic, as his men followed suit, desperately attempting to push back the tide of masked adversaries that flooded the warehouse. The arms deal with the Sujita had begun smoothly enough, weapons stolen from Ryo now poised to be exchanged for profit, but the tranquility was shattered in an instant. With a deafening explosion, the fortified gate crumbled, and the entrance was swiftly breached, allowing a torrent of armed assailants to pour into the space. Gunfire erupted from every direction, echoing off the walls as chaos enveloped the once quiet warehouse. Kuki Sujita, the intended buyer, lay motionless in a crimson pool, his life extinguished in a hail of bullets. Hiroshi ducked instinctively, his fingers fumbling to reload his Tommy gun as he sought to retaliate against the encroaching threat. But his efforts were futile. The bullets ricocheted harmlessly off the armor that encased his adversaries. Cursing under his breath, he braced himself for another futile attempt, determined to defy the inevitable onslaught. Suddenly, the air filled with the deafening roar of an approaching LAV-25, its imposing silhouette casting a pall over the scene of carnage. In a merciless display of firepower, the armored vehicle unleashed a barrage of devastation, mowing down every living soul caught in its path. Bodies fell, grotesquely twisted and broken, as the warehouse became a charnel house of blood and destruction. Hiroshi's world dissolved into agony as a searing pain tore through his abdomen, his gut rent open and his lifeblood spilling onto the cold concrete floor. Gasping for air, he gurgled a final breath, his eyes glazed with the grim realization that his fate had been sealed amidst the merciless chaos of war. In the end, amidst the relentless onslaught, Hiroshi Tekuchi's existence flickered and faded, a mere whisper in the cacophony of violence that engulfed the warehouse, leaving only silence and the lingering specter of death in its wake. Jinichi Tekuchi reclined in his chair, an air of smugness enveloping him as he gazed upon the woman bound before him, her eyes betraying a mixture of defiance and fear. His words dripped with cruel amusement as he taunted her, reveling in the power he held over her fate. 
So, how's your day been, sweetheart? Not so peaky, I'd wager, he jeered, his voice laced with malice. The woman's scowl faltered, replaced by a mask of worry as his words sank in. Janichi chuckled darkly, relishing the fear he instilled in her. We've already snagged those other three troublemakers, you know. They're probably getting quite the welcome party by now, he continued, his tone dripping with sadistic pleasure. Her silence only fueled his delight as he painted vivid images of the torment awaiting her companion. But then, a crash shattered the tense atmosphere, the deafening sound of destruction heralding the arrival of chaos. An ominous vehicle, a Degori II, careened into the bar, its monstrous minigun raining death upon the Takuchi occupants with ruthless efficiency. From its dark confines emerged three figures, their presence commanding and foreboding. Two of them were masked, their identities shrouded in mystery, while the third, a figure draped in a black military trench coat, his skin an unsettling shade of tar, stole the spotlight. His eyes glowed with an eerie luminosity, piercing through the chaos with a chilling intensity. Jenich's world dissolved into agony as the minigun tore through flesh and bone, leaving devastation in its wake. His left leg obliterated. He writhed in excruciating pain, powerless beneath the boot of his mysterious assailant. A voice, dark and foreboding, resonated through the chaos, addressing him with an unsettling familiarity. Jenichi Takuchi, a pleasure to make your acquaintance, the figure intoned, his words dripping with sinister intent. In his hand, he brandished a grisly offering, a blood-soaked bag containing the severed head of Jenich's younger brother, Haruki. The twisted laughter that followed sent shivers down even Jenich's spine. As the scene unfolded in grotesque detail, the entity addressed another present, Ayakubo, known as Enias, a survivor whose presence seemed to elicit both amusement and disdain. With a cruel display of power, the entity tore out Jenich's spine, a macabre testament to his dominance over the Takuchi clan. With an air of finality, the entity vanished, leaving behind a scene of unparalleled brutality and despair. Jenichi, his lifeblood draining away, could only gurgle in shock and disbelief as the darkness closed in around him, sealing his fate in the annals of history's darkest chapters. The Kiro Takuchi, the once mighty patriarch of the Takuchi clan, found himself in a grim tableau. His office, once a symbol of power and authority, had transformed into a makeshift fortress as the remaining members of his family huddled together for their final stand. The air was thick with tension, and the muted sounds of preparations filled the room. Beside him, Shintekuchi, the aged founder of the clan, clutched his trusty hunting shotgun. The room bore the signs of hurried barricades, tables overturned, makeshift cover arranged. The news of his brother's deaths had triggered a lockdown. Every family member taking up arms to defend their legacy. Akiro had made the difficult choice to send his wife and daughters away, hoping they'd escape the impending bloodshed. The distant rumble of approaching vehicles signaled the onset of their adversaries. The mansion was a fortress, a bastion that had withstood countless trials. But this time, it felt different. The sound of gunfire erupted outside, a cacophony of chaos and death that echoed through the once grand halls. Reports over the radio hinted at the relentless onslaught. The defenders outside valiantly fought back. But the mention of a tank sent shivers through the air. An explosion shook the mansion. The invaders breaching its defenses. Silence descended, ominous and oppressive. Suddenly, the door to Akiro's office began to splinter and buckle under relentless force. His cousins and uncles rose to meet the threat, but their resistance proved futile. Bullets tore through the room, leaving carnage in their wake. Taiki's machine gun nest became a tomb for the fallen, and the once proud Takuchi mansion echoed with the sounds of tragedy. The leader of the assailants, an enigmatic figure with tar black skin, strode in with an air of triumph. His words hung heavy in the air, taunting the once mighty clan now reduced to corpses. Akiro, driven by a surge of defiance, raised his pistol and fired, only to be met with a hail of bullets that ripped through his abdomen. As Akiro stood trembling, blood cascading from his mouth, he clutched at the entrails that spilled through his fingers. A grotesque tableau of mortality unfolded. His final act of resistance was cut short as he collapsed, his eyes closing in a final surrender to the inevitable. The night in the night district, marked by betrayal and violence, concluded with the fall of the Takuchi clan. Gaimai emerged from the besieged mansion, the echoes of chaos still lingering in the air. Behind him stood the mysterious warriors of Division Cerberus, shrouded in darkness and anonymity. The night was theirs, and the fallen head of Akiro Takuchi served as a gruesome trophy in Gaimai's grasp. As he stepped into the open, the moonlight revealed an array of ominous vehicles, a fleet of black-clad warriors ready to enforce the will of Division Cerberus, vans, APCs, and a tank formed a spectral convoy, silent witnesses to the downfall of a once-dominant clan. With Akiro's severed head held aloft, Gaimai's voice cut through the night. Cerberus has won. The declaration echoed in the darkness, met by the cheers of his enigmatic comrades. A twisted celebration ensued, an eerie juxtaposition against the grim reality of the burning Takuchi mansion. 
the head raised high, Gaimai reveled in the triumph of Cerberus. The clandestine division wasted no time, setting the mansion ablaze as if erasing any trace of the once mighty Takuchi clan from existence. Flames consumed the bastion, casting an ominous glow across the scene of devastation. In the midst of the inferno, Division Cerberus melted into the shadows, disappearing into the night like ghosts. The distant wail of police sirens heralded the arrival of the authorities, drawn to the scene by the scent of blood and the remnants of a clan's demise. A night, stained with betrayal and retribution, would forever bear witness to the enigmatic force that was Division Cerberus. Izuku sat back in his bedroom, surrounded by the quietude of the night. His room, a sanctuary within the chaos that unfolded in the night district, provided a stark contrast to the mayhem his avian scouts had witnessed. The birds, his vigilant patrol in the night sky, had borne witness to the ruthless efficiency of Division Cerberus and the downfall of the Takuchi clan. Initially, horror gripped him as the scenes of carnage unfolded before his eyes. However, as he contemplated the aftermath, a realization dawned upon him. Daimai, the ancient entity within him, manifested as a chaotic force, had not stooped to the depraved depths of the Takuchi clan's criminal activity. While the method of takeover was brutal, Gaimai seemed to prioritize a different kind of order. A revelation struck Izuku. Gaimai wasn't merely orchestrating chaos, he was beginning a systematic takeover of the criminal world. A subtle understanding settled within Izuku's mind. Gaimai aimed to establish a foothold in Japan, preparing for an impending war that he claimed was on the horizon. It was a war that transcended heroes and villains, a conflict that would reshape the very foundations of society. As Izuku pondered the implications, a small, uncorrupted part within him screamed to intervene, to resist the encroaching darkness. However, as he observed the green flame within him, once a symbol of hope and purity, it morphed into a darker shade. The realization of the strategic advantages of Gaimai's brutal takeover dawned upon him. The need for order, even if born from chaos, held a certain pragmatism that Izuku couldn't ignore. In the recesses of his mind, thoughts coalesced into a plan. Izuku recognized that Gaimai's influence could be harnessed to create safe zones for civilians, shielding them from the impending storm. He decided that, while he might not be a hero in the traditional sense, he could be a force for good within the constraints of Gaimai's intricate game. Tomorrow marked his first day back at UA, and for the moment, Izuku resolved to continue his studies. However, his role had evolved, no longer solely a hero in training. He would now be the observer, searching for weaknesses within the fortress of heroism. Plans formed in his mind as he drifted into sleep, the night enveloping him in a cloak of uncertainty and newfound purpose. Meanwhile, in the newly named Kubo Scrapyard, Gaimai sat in his office, bathed in the dim glow of a solitary lamp. The letter from Aya Kubo, though declining immediate participation in Gaimai's plans, hinted at a willingness to join once the war unfolded. Gaimai acknowledged her allegiance with a sense of satisfaction. Realizing the importance of having such strategic minds align with his vision, as he contemplated Aya's letter, a sense of grim determination settled over him. The Ben, now bolstered by the destruction of the little cat, had filled its ranks with those who had once suffered under the oppressive regime of the Takuchi clan. The women, forced into prostitution, found an unexpected liberation as they became part of Gaimai's clandestine force. Among them was a daughter of a small clan, the Moriyama clan, residing in the warehouse district adjacent to the night district. The moment Division Cerberus brought her home, her father, seeking to make amends, pledged allegiance to the cause. The Moriyama clan now stood as one of many within the Ben, their collective strength growing as the alliance expanded. Simultaneously, in Kagoshima, forces from Division Spine, a faction of Army Skull, scouted potential allies and enemies. Gaimai chuckled, contemplating the intricate web of alliances and rivalries shaping up across Japan. In his mind, the outcome was clear. Those who stood with him would survive the impending war, while those against him would meet their demise. The laughter resonated through the office, an eerie symphony accompanying Gaimai's contemplation of the unfolding chessboard. The pieces were set, alliances forged, and divisions defined. As the wheels of fate turned, Gaimai reveled in the knowledge that he was the architect of a new era. One where the strong would prevail, and the weak would be swept away in the tide of change. Izuku sat in the passenger seat of a sleek black Ford Vendome, Gaimai at the wheel. The car smoothly navigated the streets, a protective shield for Izuku on his way to Yue. Unbeknownst to his mother, who had arranged for this security after hearing of the Night District Massacre, Gaimai was the mastermind behind the brutal operation that ended 30 years of Takuchi clan rule in the eastern part of the district. The truth remained hidden from the oblivious public. Only Izuku and the members of Division Cerberus were privy to the orchestrated chaos. As they rode, the gravity of recent events weighed on Izuku's mind. Tonight, he had decided to align himself with Gaimai's cause, acknowledging the impending war between villains and heroes. However, he had a condition to ensure that innocent lives were not caught in the crossfire. After thinking about it tonight, 
I think I will join you when this war between villains and heroes comes. But I have one thing that needs to happen, Izuku declared, breaking the silence in the car. Gaimai arched an eyebrow, curious about the condition. And that is, safe zones, Izuku replied. When the war happens, I want at least a few safe places for civilians. Gaimai pondered for a moment, recognizing the practicality of the request. Hmm, you know what, it does make sense. Can't make an empire of dead people, huh? Well then, my vessel, we have a deal. With the agreement settled, the car came to a stop just outside the gates of UA. Gaimai spoke, I'll see you later then. Go to the Kubo scrapyard. We'll talk more there. Izuku nodded, stepping out of the car. The sun illuminated his new UA uniform as he gazed at the imposing letters on top of the main entrance. The future, he knew, held the promise of destruction for all of it. With that somber thought, he entered through the main gate, ready to navigate the tumultuous path that lay ahead. As Izuku walked through the halls of UA, he observed the simplicity of the design, finding it straightforward to navigate despite its size. To him, the layout was intuitive, just keep moving forward. Eventually, he reached the imposing door of Class 1A. Although Kendo, Monoma, and Takage were in 1B, he found solace in knowing that Yuraraka, a familiar face, was also in 1A. Quietly slipping into the classroom, Izuku's hopes of a smooth entrance were dashed as he stumbled upon a discussion between two students, Ada and Bakugo. While he harbored no active animosity toward Bakugo, he wasn't particularly thrilled about spending the entire school year in the same class with him. Yet, he reminded himself that such concerns were inconsequential. He would soon be aligning himself with a different faction. With a resigned acceptance, Izuku settled into his assigned desk, hoping to remain unnoticed for the time being. As Izuku quietly observed his new surroundings, he was taken aback by an unexpected sight, a yellow sleeping bag with a man inside. Their eyes met, and without exchanging words, the man in the sleeping bag gestured with a finger against his lips. Taking the cue in stride, Izuku responded with a casual thumbs up. Deciding not to dwell on the peculiar encounter, he opened one of his notebooks, delving into research on firearms as he began to plan for the challenges that lay ahead. Machako Yuraka approached Izuku's desk, identifying him as the military guy Kendo had mentioned. Izuku, slightly amused, responded, Really, military guy? That's what they came up with. Yuraka nervously chuckled at the comment. Meanwhile, the yellow sleeping bag in the corner stood up, unzipped itself, revealing a racer hat. Izuku recognized him by the goggles, scarf, and overall homeless vibe. Aizawa introduced himself as Aizawa Shota, their homeroom teacher. As Aizawa spoke, Izuku was deep in thought, contemplating how to navigate his relationship with this particular teacher in the future. Aizawa emphasized that wasting time on internal conflicts would lead them nowhere in the hero profession. He distributed gym uniforms, declaring they would be undergoing a quirk apprehension test. When Yuraka inquired about orientation, Aizawa dismissed it as a waste of time, emphasizing that at UA, teachers had the flexibility to alter schedules at a moment's notice. Yuraka expressed her surprise, and Aizawa responded sternly, orientation is just a waste of time. And also here in UA, teachers are seen to teach their class as they wish, so things like class schedules could be changed in just a second. Now get dressed. Taking no time to spare, Izuku headed to the box, grabbed a uniform, and made his way outside the classroom. He couldn't help but notice Bakugo's enraged expression as he learned that Deku had successfully passed the exam. Izuku efficiently dressed himself in the gym uniform, utilizing the skills he had acquired through Gaimai's training. As the other male students arrived and engaged in conversations, Izuku, having completed his preparation, headed straight for the training field. Aizawa was already present, waiting for the students to begin the quirk apprehension test. The atmosphere was charged with anticipation as the students gathered for the challenging task ahead. Aizawa observed the students as they assembled on the training field. Midoriya Izuku's early arrival caught his attention, and the peculiar quirk he had developed after the UA exams intrigued the homeroom teacher. The ability to tame animals and turn them into soldiers was a unique and potentially powerful skill. As the rest of the students gradually gathered, Aizawa couldn't help but feel a sense of frustration with the notable personalities in his class, particularly Bakugo Katsuki and Ida Tenya. Each had their own challenges, and Aizawa prepared himself for the task of molding this diverse group into heroes. The anticipation hung in the air as the students, including Midoriya, stood ready for the quirk apprehension test. Aizawa, with his characteristic scarf and stern demeanor, was prepared to assess their abilities and determine who had what it took to succeed at UA. It took most of you four minutes to be ready, in the future, that will have to change. Anyhow, now, the reason for this test is for students to show the limit of their quirk. Aizawa's stern gaze swept across the assembled students. He reached for a baseball, holding it in his hand, and directed his attention to Bakugo Katsuki. Bakugo Katsuki, you were the first on the entrance exam. How much meters was your ball throw? 
Aizawa inquired, his voice carrying a no-nonsense tone. 75 meters, Bakugo responded confidently. Aizawa hummed an acknowledgement. All right then, Bakugo, could you stand in the white circle on the floor? Bakugo complied, taking his position within the designated area. Aizawa then tossed the baseball at Bakugo. Go throw this as far as you can with the use of your quirk. The challenge was set, and all eyes were on Bakugo as he prepared to showcase the explosive power of his quirk. The tension in the air was palpable, and the quirk apprehension test was officially underway. With a roar, Bakugo screamed, Die! The explosive detonation accompanied the forceful throw of the ball, soaring into the distance. Aizawa, ever stoic, observed the display with a critical eye before checking his device. 705.2 meters. Impressive but could be better, Aizawa remarked, his expectations holding a high standard. Bakugo, despite the achievement, scoffed and returned to the line. Various reactions rippled through the crowd of students. Some appeared intimidated. Ada expressed disapproval of Bakugo's behavior, and then there was Izuku. His expression remained largely unimpressed, having witnessed Gaimai's gruesome actions that eclipsed any display of power in the classroom. To him, Bakugo's theatrics were a far cry from the chilling reality he had seen unfold in the night district. The excitement over using quirks echoed through the class, particularly from a student with pink skin and horns protruding from her head. Her anticipation was evident as she exclaimed, We get to use our quirks. This is gonna be fun. Izuku raised an eyebrow, somewhat incredulous that these individuals were being trained to become heroes. However, as he pondered the idea, he couldn't help but notice the stark contrast between the apparent joviality of heroes and the grim reality he had experienced. A subtle shift in Aizawa's expression betrayed his annoyance the moment those words left her lips. The hero in training atmosphere and the pragmatic reality of their future profession clashed in that instance. Oh, fun now. Well, how about this? The one that gets the lowest score gets expelled. With that proclamation, the atmosphere in the class became more strained. For Izuku, the idea of expulsion didn't bother him much. He had already chosen his side, and if expulsion came, it might provide him with more freedom. However, he decided not to half-ass the tests just because of this threat. As Aizawa continued with the tests, Izuku observed the reactions of his classmates. One student with half-red, half-white hair and a significant burn scar had a similar nonchalant expression to Izuku's. Another girl with black hair and a ponytail didn't seem too concerned about the possibility of expulsion. During the various tests, Izuku performed averagely. Gaimai's training, resembling a boot camp, had prepared him well, even without relying on his two unique abilities. Instead, he used the opportunity to mentally note the quirks of his fellow students. As the last test approached, the ball throw, Izuku considered his approach. Observing the black-haired girl, he asked, Hey, can your quirk create whatever you know of? Getting a nod in response, he turned to Aizawa and asked, Am I allowed to ask for an item? Aizawa shrugged, and the girl, apparently unfazed, handed him a leather glove. Thanks, Izuku said before letting out a loud whistle. A majestic saker falcon landed on his gloved hand. Izuku handed the ball to the bird, and it flew off. Similar to Yuraraka's approach, the device displayed an infinity symbol, signifying the impressive distance achieved by Izuku's unconventional method. Tatsuki's eyes narrowed as he observed the green-haired kid in the white circle. The transformation from the last time he saw him, two months ago, was startling. This wasn't the same timid Deku from Aldera. His eyes seemed devoid of life, and his demeanor was different, almost unrecognizable. What puzzled Katsuki even more was the revelation that the once quirkless and seemingly useless Deku now possessed a quirk, something inconceivable. The fact that Deku could apparently communicate with animals didn't strike Katsuki as particularly heroic, but it shattered his perception of Deku as a nobody. It implied that all those years, Deku had concealed his quirk, deceiving everyone around him and looking down on Katsuki in the process. Fueled by this realization, Katsuki exploded with anger. Hey, Deku, you better explain yourself. He bellowed, advancing menacingly toward the now seemingly formidable figure. However, before Katsuki could escalate the situation further, he found himself ensnared in the hobo's scarf. A sudden realization dawned on him, his quirk was being nullified. Aizawa's presence loomed, his eyes ablaze with intensity and his hair standing on end. This is no time for childish rivalries. You either behave or get an early ticket out of here. Aizawa's voice cut through the tension, commanding attention and compliance. Amidst the chaos, Izuku remained detached, his thoughts elsewhere. He couldn't help but wonder what Gaimai was up to at that moment, imagining that Gaimai was likely having a more enjoyable time than he was. Meanwhile, in Taramizu, within the household of the O'Floin clan, Sima's O'Floin sat at his desk, engaged in conversation with an intriguing figure, William Tarosian. The man held the rank of staff sergeant in Division Spine a branch of army skull within the NCC. Seema's, unfamiliar with such divisions, listened intently as Tarosian explained their involvement in the recent massacre of the Takuchi clan in Shizuoka Prefecture. 
Tarosian presented a proposal. The integration of Ofloin into their leader's organization, an entity willing to absorb any crime family, regardless of size. Simos, sensing the implicit threat, sighed in resignation. Let me guess, if I refuse, my clan will end up like the Tekuchi, right? He asked, anticipating the harsh consequences of denial. Tarosian merely shrugged, a nonchalant acknowledgement of the likely outcome. Meanwhile, downstairs, Corporal Andridge C. Verbulize, Yuri Kazlu, and Hendrik Vonnegut engaged with O'Floin members in a spirited rendition of the Dubliner's Whiskey in the Jar. The chorus echoed through the building, blending the camaraderie of soldiers and criminals in a shared moment of song. The scene painted an unusual picture of alliance and cooperation in the midst of uncertainty and potential upheaval. The group of men continued their mission, traversing the streets with purpose. Staff Sergeant William Tarosian meticulously checked his list of clan names in Kagoshima Prefecture. Poloski, a clan with Polish roots, and Hunjo, a Japanese-rooted clan, had both accepted the proposition. However, the Anakoni and Tani clans had declined the offer. Their next target was the Atar clan in Shibushi, known for its Persian origins. Sohail Atar, the clan leader, joined them at a park for the meeting. Sohail, straightforward as always, inquired about their intentions. William offered a succinct explanation, presenting the option to join or decline. And what if I don't? Questioned Sohail, considering his options. William, maintaining a confident demeanor, replied, Well, you'll see. Sohail, after a moment of contemplation, shook his head, deciding not to align with their cause. William watched as Sohail walked away, crossing another name off the list. The next target on their list was the Morikawa clan. Corporal Vonnegut extended a handshake to Sora Morikawa, the heir who had agreed to join upon his father's imminent passing. With each successful negotiation, their network of allies expanded, inching them closer to their goals. Upon returning to the makeshift military base, which was essentially a warehouse, Staff Sergeant William Tarosian immediately sought out Colonel Ingolfson, the commander of their base, to provide a detailed report on their finding. The rest of Company 4, Division Spine, mingled in the warehouse, sharing their experiences. Among the squads, Squad 3 emerged with the most success, securing agreements from six out of the ten targeted clans. These included Clan Chiba, Sonata, Humni, Brzeziki, Okimura, and the Tso clan. Squad 1 had the least success, managing to convince only one out of the ten clans to join the Unger clan. The remaining squads achieved moderate success in securing alliances, contributing to the gradual expansion of their network. As the day concluded, the men were grouped to strategize and prepare for the next steps in their mission. Meanwhile, Kaimai listened to the familiar sounds of Mei working in the background as Izuku entered the office. The young man commented on the place and humorously remarked about Gaimai spending his time there when not in Izuku's mind. Gaimai responded to his comment and then shifted the conversation to their plans. Gaimai outlined his strategy, suggesting they wait for the villains to make a move before forcefully inserting themselves into the criminal world. He considered the Takuchi incident as a test, noting that the world didn't react strongly to their actions. Gaimai advised Izuku to continue his studies for the time being and, if necessary, drop out or leave Yue if it became a hindrance. The idea was to let chaos unfold before making their move. Izuku absorbed the information, nodding and understanding. The alliance between Gaimai and Izuku continued to evolve, their paths intertwined with a shared purpose. As Izuku approached the entrance of Yue, he noticed a black Mercury Monterey driving away. Today, it wasn't Gaimai who had brought him, instead, another individual had taken him here. Despite the lack of conversation during the ride, Izuku continued on his way. However, as he drew closer to the entrance, he encountered a horde of reporters swarming any student they could find, attempting to navigate through the crowd. Izuku found himself targeted by a persistent reporter who thrust a microphone in his face. Hello, would you have any comment on All Might being a teacher in UA? Izuku raised an eyebrow and responded curtly, Um, no, he tried to move through the crowd again. Only to be bombarded with another question, do you have any info on All Might as a teacher? Izuku shrugged in annoyance, haven't seen him teach yet, how should I know? Ask 1B students or something, they've already had a class with him. Just as the questioning persisted, Izuku decided he had had enough. With a swarm of pigeons, crows, house swifts, tree swallows, and other birds, he unleashed his avian allies to chase away the reporters. The chaotic flurry of feathers and chirping successfully scattered the intrusive journalists allowing Izuku to slip through the crowd and make his way into Yue undisturbed. As both Hisashi and I stood at the entrance, fending off the reporters, Hisashi playfully suggested that we could consider them trespassers and knock them out. While the idea had its appeal, I promptly dismissed it, pointing out that freedom of the press was a human right, 
and I had no intention of becoming a human rights violator just yet. To Hazashi's surprise and my relief, a large number of birds suddenly swooped in, treating the reporters as mortal enemies. The chaos of feathers and flapping wings scattered the intrusive journalists, providing a convenient distraction for us to clear the entrance. Hazashi wondered aloud, was the noise agitating them or something? I glanced at the commotion with a raised eyebrow. No, there were birds of prey and predators in there, so they would have likely been killing each other. Ah, I think it was one of my students' quirks, can tame animals and all that. Hizashi whistled. Must have done a lot of work for so many birds, eh? I hummed in agreement. Probably. Izuku's intuition was telling him that he was being observed ever since he stepped foot into Yue. However, it didn't seem like any student was tailing him. That left only one possibility in his mind. Principal Nezu. Nezu, with his unique animal-like appearance and his high-spec quirk, was a highly intelligent creature. His intelligence was a double-edged sword. On one hand, trying to outsmart him was like trying to sneak Himmler into heaven, nearly impossible. On the other hand, Nezu's worldview was strictly based on rationality and chance. Supernatural entities like Gaimai would never register unless they directly manifest. Despite these considerations, Izuku knew he was being watched. So, when he found himself far from any prying ears or eyes, he conjured a house mouse in his hands. Go make father proud, will you? He whispered to the mouse before sending it on a mission to discreetly gather information within UAS halls, reporting back to Izuku anything noteworthy at Discover. As the day unfolded, Izuku attended various classes, paying close attention to the theoretical battle trials and absorbing knowledge about heroics. Meanwhile, his house mouse, Haishi, continued its discreet observations within UA. When English class with present Mike, or Yamada-sensei, began, Haishi eavesdropped on a conversation between Aizawa and Midnight, also known as Nimuri Kayama. So how's the teaching going? Midnight asked Aizawa. Some are headaches, some tolerable. Why? Aizawa replied, expressing the challenges he faced with his students. The conversation then shifted to the upcoming dual class training session at the USJ. It seemed that All Might had switched classes, leading to the need for a quick adjustment to turn the USJ into a dual training session. Yeah, it's a dual class training session. Apparently, All Might changed classes last second, so now we had to quickly turn the USJ into a dual training session. Though well, better to have some camaraderie than rivalry between the classes. If only Kan wouldn't keep trying to create rivalries, Aizawa remarked. Izuku listened attentively through Haishi's ears, absorbing information about the changes in the training sessions and the dynamics between classes. It seemed like the heroes were trying to foster camaraderie among the students, but challenges and rivalries still persisted. As Izuku navigated through the bustling cafeteria crowd, he procured a serving of katsudon from lunch rush and sought out a table. To his delight, he was greeted by Kendo's familiar voice, prompting him to join her, Monomo, and Takage at their table. After settling in, Kendo initiated conversation, asking about Izuku's day. He quickly caught up, mentioning the theoretical battle trials conducted by All Might and how he was already familiar with the concept. Curious about All Might's teaching style, Kendo shared that while All Might wasn't the best teacher, he was still tolerable. Takage chimed in, mentioning All Might's rather unorthodox approach to teaching, like reading a teacher guide for dummies during class. Monomo interjected with a playful jab, implying that All Might's presence in 1B meant their superiority over 1A. Izuku brushed off the remark, acknowledging it with a roll of his eyes. Just then, Yuraka joined the table, inquiring about Izuku's abrupt disappearance after the bell. His response was cryptic yet straightforward, attributing his knowledge to a very good teacher. The lunchtime banter continued, with Izuku settling into the camaraderie of his classmates while keeping his thoughts about his unconventional mentor to himself. As the alarm blared through the sirens, signaling a code red, chaos erupted in the cafeteria. Students from the second and third years hastily rushed towards the exits, driven by the urgency of the situation. Amidst the commotion, Izuku remained seated, calmly enjoying his meal. Curious about the code red, he sought information from a senior who explained that it indicated a villain intrusion into the school. Most of his tablemates joined the stampede to safety, but Izuku continued eating. The noise, however, began to grate on his nerves. While Gaimai reveled in the chaos, another part of him decided to intervene. From Takoba Beach, a bald eagle located a specific bird, a burgish crier rooster perched on a camper. The rooster willingly allowed itself to be picked up, and the pair swiftly made their way to Yue High. The bald eagle crashed through a window, placing the rooster on Izuku's table. With a loud crow, the eagle announced its presence, perching on Izuku's shoulder. As the students turned their attention to the unexpected spectacle, Izuku swallowed a bite of his katsudan and addressed the room. There are reporters outside, not villains. Even if there are villains, I thought this was a hero school, not a civilian one. Maybe act like it, he remarked, his tone reminiscent of Gaimai's, resonating with an assertive confidence. Nezu contemplated the information on his screen, 
finding Izuku's abilities both intriguing and impressive. The young man's knack for taming various bird species, including powerful and challenging ones, added another layer of mystery to his already enigmatic persona. However, Nezu's focus shifted to more pressing matters, such as the recent upheaval in Musutafu's Night District. The Takuchi clan, once a dominant force, had been obliterated in a swift and brutal manner. Genichi Tekuchi's demise, with his spine impaled through his lower jaw, served as a grim message from the unknown orchestrators, leaving a power vacuum that the Moriyama clan seemed to opportunistically fill. Nezu suspected that someone else was pulling the strings, using the Moriyama as a front. In the face of this shadowy manipulation, Nezu couldn't help but feel a sense of concern. The ever-growing chaos in the city, coupled with the rise of mysterious figures, presented a challenge that couldn't be ignored. However, the news of this event quickly faded into the background, overshadowed by the widespread reports of villain attacks across the nation. The day at Yue had come to an end, and Izuku found himself standing outside the gates, awaiting the familiar sight of the Black Mercury Monterey that signaled Gaimai's arrival. The car, conspicuous amidst the vibrant hues of other vehicles, pulled up, and Izuku slid into the passenger seat as Gaimai took the wheel. How was the second day? Gaimai inquired, his voice holding a hint of curiosity. Izuku, nonchalant, simply shrugged. Good enough. Oh, and I think those villains you keep mentioning are gearing up for action. Gaimai's eyes glinted with intrigue. USJ, tomorrow. He ventured. Izuku nodded. Exactly. They're planning something, and I think it might be worth our attention. The corners of Gaimai's mouth curled into a smile. Well, in that case, I'll have some Cerberus snipers positioned in the building. Taking out a few villains before they strike can't hurt? Can it? Izuku pondered the idea, a mix of caution and curiosity crossing his features. But won't that risk exposure? If they discover our interference, Gaimai's smile only widened. My dear Izuku, I could slip a sleeper cell into Tartarus without anyone batting an eye. Kagoshima is meticulously mapped out, and yet the world remains oblivious. If they find out, it's just a mere scratch on the surface of what we're capable of. Now, let's get to it. Izuku sighed. It was about to be his first experience in such matters. A stranger had been poking around Kubo's scrapyard, and Gaimai saw it as an opportunity for a lesson in the arts of torture and interrogation. As the black car glided through the city streets, an unspoken promise of impending doom seemed to trail behind it. The midnight sky cast a pale glow upon the unforeseen simulation joint, its glassy dome reflecting the moonlight. Adjacent to the facility was a small, intentionally planted forest, meticulously arranged by Nezu the intelligent creature overseeing Yue. The perimeter of the formidable fortress was enclosed by a wall, a protective barrier guarding the heart of heroism. However, on this ominous night, the seemingly impenetrable defenses faced an unprecedented threat. Five enigmatic figures emerged from the shadows, clad in complete black, their identities shrouded in mystery. Each carried a duffel bag containing carefully concealed camouflage gear. Four of them shouldered Blazer R-93 tactical rifles, lethal instruments designed for precision and silence. The fifth figure bore an Anzio 20mm rifle, a formidable weapon too cumbersome to be slung across the shoulder, hidden in a separate bag. Silently scaling the towering wall that guarded Yue, the infiltrators moved with calculated efficiency. The glassy dome, illuminated by the ethereal glow of the moon, loomed above them. With practiced skill, they created an opening in the dome large enough for their entry, attaching ropes for a controlled descent. As they reached the ground, the hole they had made was skillfully concealed, leaving no trace of their intrusion. The infiltrators dispersed, each heading to a different zone within the sprawling facility. Unbeknownst to Nezu, Aizawa, All Might, and the rest of UAS Vigilant Defenders, Division Cerberus had infiltrated the very heart of heroism. The quietude of the night concealed the impending storm, as the shadows within the walls of UA harbored an imminent threat that would soon unfold. The morning sun gently illuminated the cityscape as Izuku woke up, his room bathed in the soft hues of dawn. As he went through his daily routine, he couldn't shake the realization that Gaimai had deployed snipers within UAS unforeseen simulation joint. Despite the seeming incongruity, Izuku understood that Gaimai's unorthodox methods were often grounded in an unconventional wisdom. Dressed in his school uniform, Izuku took a moment to tighten his tie, a skill that Gaimai had imparted, emphasizing the importance of presenting oneself formally. A quick farewell to his mother, and he waited for the familiar car that routinely picked him up. Gaimai was at the wheel once again, driving with an air of nonchalance that seemed to cloak his calculating mind. Gaimai, ever the bearer of surprises, casually revealed a new ability to Izuku, psychotic bloodlust, a name that resonated with its ominous implications. While it heightened senses and physical capabilities, the catch lay in the uncontrollable descent into a psychotic killing spree. A trump card, but one to be used sparingly. The news that there were five men infiltrating the USJ, positioned as snipers, didn't phase Izuku. 
In fact, he took it in stride, understanding that Gaimai's sense of amusement could lead to some unpredictable yet potentially beneficial outcomes. So if the snipers get bored, they'll just end a few villains for fun. Izuku queried, mentally absorbing the information. Gaimai's affirmative nod hinted at the capricious nature of these operatives. They get bored pretty quick. Just be prepared, kid. Your classmates might be in for a bit of a shock. Izuku, ever pragmatic, merely shrugged off the potential consequences. Death is common in the hero world, he mused, his perspective shaped by a reality that often demanded resilience. It'll reveal who can deal with it and who can't. As the car came to a halt, a crow soared ahead, signaling Izuku's departure. Oh, and Izuku, Gaimai called out before the car sped away. Don't be surprised if Kagoshima turns into a war zone. I've got some matters to attend to there. See ya. Left alone on the pavement, Izuku processed the forewarnings and revelations, preparing to navigate the challenges that awaited him at UA, fully aware that the unusual events unfolding around him were but the prologue to a much larger narrative. The morning sunlight streamed through the windows of UA, casting a warm glow on the familiar classroom where Izuku found his seat. As early birds chatted and settled into their places, Izuku took a moment to observe the comings and goings the ebb and flow of daily life within the institution that molded heroes. Haishi, his ever-loyal scout nestled in the vents and walls, tuned into a conversation between two key figures, Nezu and the deflated form of All Might, Tashinori Yagi. Nezu, the wise and pragmatic principal, seemed to be imparting a crucial lesson to the symbol of peace. Yagi, I've told you time and time again, do not overstep your time limit. While I understand your need to save people, you must put your students before the lives of strangers. That is the job of a teacher. All Might, appearing somber and contemplative, responded to Nezu's admonitions. I get that, but it's just. Nezu's stern shake of the head cut off any further protest. It doesn't matter. So, how is your successor? Meanwhile, Izuku, seemingly engrossed in the conversation happening elsewhere, had a distant look in his eyes. Bakugo, attempting to grab Izuku's attention, stood in front of his desk and bellowed, Hey! Deku, do you think you can just ignore me? Izuku's focus, however, was momentarily elsewhere. Hey, you think you can look down on me, Deku? Bakugo's frustration echoed through the room, ignoring Bakugo's outburst. Izuku continued to eavesdrop on the conversation between Nezu and All Might. The latter spoke with pride about his chosen successor, Kendo, highlighting her victories over the Zero Pointer and success in the battle trials alongside Monomo. She does resemble quite some ideals heroism needs, Nezu remarked with a small smile. Well, then let's drink some tea and talk about the past, shall we? Having gleaned enough information, Izuku subtly cut the connection with Haishi. Unbeknownst to him, Bakugo was still standing in front of his desk, fuming with anger. Izuku's response, however, was not directed at Bakugo but rather at the burgish crier that had lingered in the room since the cafeteria incident. Bakugo, hands on the desk, shouted, Hey, you think you can look down on me, huh, Deku? Izuku's reply was unconventional yet effective. The rooster responded with sharp pecks to Bakugo's shins. An irritated Bakugo yelled, Og, stupid chicken, I'll make a stew out of you, you little shit. The rooster, unfazed, darted out of the classroom just as Aizawa entered, casting a quizzical glance at the peculiar scene. As Aizawa observed the burgish kraher making a sharp turn and disappearing down the hallway, he couldn't help but shake his head. The creature had become an unexpected source of amusement for Nezu. And while it added a quirky touch to the daily routine, Aizawa appreciated that it didn't disturb his precious naps. It seemed the rooster had found a unique way to keep the class quiet, inadvertently making it somewhat endearing, at least in Aizawa's eyes, just below his cats but above Nimiri. Now standing at the front of the class, he noticed the students hushed in the aftermath of the rooster's brief escapade, pondering the idea of keeping the rooster around and perhaps giving it a name. Aizawa couldn't deny the entertainment it provided compared to other attempts by teachers to maintain order. Shaking off the distraction, Aizawa refocused on the task at hand, the joint training exercise at the unforeseen simulation joint. Addressing the class, he informed them of the upcoming activity with Class 1B and revealed a set of briefcases and a duffel bag containing their requested hero suits. All right, class, today we will have a joint training exercise with Class 1B at the USJ. Also, he continued, pressing a button that revealed the array of briefcases, and these are the hero suits each of you have requested. Either you take them with you, or you don't. Your choice. Leaving the classroom, Aizawa made his way to the bus outside, where he intended to wait for his students to gather. The USJ awaited them, and the anticipation among the students grew as they contemplated the training exercise and the unique challenges that awaited. Lavrenti Kapanans, known by his alias Phoenix Shot, crouched in the dense bushes of the mountain zone within the unforeseen simulation joint. Clad in a ghillie suit that blended seamlessly with the foliage, he maintained his silent vigil over the sprawling landscape. Lavrenti, 
hailing from the divided nation of Georgia, had experienced the turmoil of civil war following the court collapse. Georgia, like many countries, remained fractured into warring factions, as the influence of the National Crisis Committee expanded, reaching even into Europe. Lavrenti's homeland faced a fate akin to Russia and China. Joining the local NCC force in Ushkulai, Lavrenti climbed through the ranks, eventually becoming a sergeant in Division Cerberus, Company 4. Specializing in sniping, he wielded an Anzio 20mm rifle, a formidable tool in his hands. Now, stationed as part of a sniper squad, Lavrenti gazed through the scope of his rifle, patiently awaiting the arrival of potential villains in the USJ. The anticipation hung in the air as he maintained his concealed position ready to respond with deadly precision when the moment arrived. Izuku Midoriya stood confidently before the waiting bus, his eyes concealed behind shades that added an air of mystery to his appearance. His hero outfit, a stark departure from the traditional UA uniforms, exuded a sense of practicality and readiness for combat. The ensemble included a black blazer and tie, a metallic jawbone mask, black pants, and a bulletproof vest. A belt adorned with pistol holsters, a revolver, and various knives accentuated his utility-focused attire. Strapped to his leg, he had a combat knife, while a machete was holstered on the back of his bulletproof vest. At his side hung a falchion sword, a formidable weapon ready for action. Completing the ensemble, a black combat helmet adorned his head, and he wore a crisp white dress shirt and sturdy combat boots. Slung casually over his shoulder was an Act 205, filled with rubber bullets for training purposes, and a subtle defiance of the restrictions on live ammunition. Izuku had loaded his Colt Diamondback revolver with real .22 WMR rounds, a testament to his preparedness. As he surveyed his peers, it was evident that his approach to hero attire was far more pragmatic and combat-oriented compared to the conventional choices made by his classmate. Iroraka's pinkish space suit-themed outfit caught Izuku's attention, its futuristic design standing out among the crowd. Ada, on the other hand, sported a suit of armor reminiscent of a knight, complete with exhaust pipes and strategic locations. It seemed that each student had chosen attire that reflected their individual style and abilities. As Izuku surveyed his classmates, he couldn't help but notice the lack of protection against knives, bullets, and other weapons. It was clear that many of them hadn't witnessed the brutality of real combat, their attire reflecting a more optimistic view of heroism. Turning his attention to the bus, Izuku observed it as attempt to organize the seating arrangements. However, the unconventional layout of the vehicle made it difficult to adhere to conventional seating plans. With a shrug, everyone found their own spot, and Izuku settled in beside Yuraraka. While Yuraraka excitedly discussed their upcoming rescue training, Izuku's mind was elsewhere. He focused on deploying his avian allies strategically around the USJ, positioning his pigeons, crows, and black kites in the nearby forest. When the time came, they would be ready to assist him in whatever challenges lay ahead. In the bus, conversations buzzed among the students, their excitement palpable as they anticipated the day's activities. See you Asui. Known for her straightforward nature, posed a question loud enough for most of the class to hear. So what do you think Midoriya's quirk is? She inquired, her curious tone cutting through the chatter. Izuku, caught off guard by the sudden attention, raised an eyebrow, wondering why his classmates were fixated on his quirk. Hiroshima, seated nearby, chimed in with his own speculation. Don't know, but it has something to do with birds, I think. Kinda like Koda. Izuku stifled a chuckle at the comparison. His quirk was far more complex than just birds or animals, but he understood their limited perspective. However, Bakugo, ever the provocateur, couldn't resist the opportunity to provoke Izuku. So what? It's just some stupid birds. Not like that will help you with being a hero. He sneered, his disdain evident in his tone. Asui, unperturbed by Bakugo's attitude, responded matter-of-factly. And your personality also won't help. Most people will probably just turn away when they see you, she remarked, her words devoid of malice but carrying a certain truth. Before Bakugo could retort, the bus came to a halt, and Aizawa stirred from his slumber, signaling the start of their journey. In the desolate ruined zone, concealed in the remnants of buildings, Diather Bowler patiently observed the central plaza through the scope of his Blazer R-93 tactical sniper rifle. A voice crackled over his comms, announcing the arrival of Class 1 and 1B students. A sinister smile crept across his face, anticipating the chaos that would ensue when the villains attacked. Unbeknownst to the students and even their newly appointed squad leader, Izuku Midoriya, Diather awaited the moment when the order to fire at will would be given. He knew his squad, armed with an array of deadly weapons, would unleash their skills upon any untrained villains in the vicinity. While the heavy artillery, an Anzio 20mm rifle, rested in the hands of Sergeant Cabinets, Diather understood the effectiveness of a well-placed bullet against less formidable adversaries. In the background, the General Director Guy Mikrov had meticulously gathered intelligence about the League of Villains, a rather clever name for their adversary. 
The league had reportedly recruited 70 villains, mostly low B rank or high E rank threats. Dyather remained confident that, in the face of danger, the vessel of Gaimai would unleash a formidable trump card, providing them with a significant advantage. As Class 1 and 1B appeared in his sight, Dyather couldn't help but feel the anticipation building. Three teachers, Aizawa Shota, Kan Sekijiro, and Kirozanen, stood with the students, their current unknown allies. He prepared his sniper rifle, eagerly toggling the safety off, ready to make the first kill in this covert mission. The ruined zone would soon become a battleground, and Dyather, hidden in the shadows, was poised to play his part. Izuku stood with his arms crossed, his keen eyes scanning the impressive building they found themselves in. Despite being aware of the formidable skills possessed by Division Cerberus, he couldn't help but be vigilant, looking around for any subtle glimmers of a sniper scope. Unsurprisingly, he found none. These individuals had proven their prowess by dismantling a powerful criminal family, making their covert presence undetectable. While 13 addressed the class, emphasizing the potential lethality of every quirk, Izuku couldn't suppress a cynical thought. No shit, he mused to himself, fully aware of the destructive capabilities inherent in many quirks. Glancing at his classmates, he noticed genuine surprise on some faces. In that moment, he couldn't help but feel a sense of disillusionment with the idealistic view of heroism that many seemed to hold. The reality of the world, especially after Gaimai's unleashed powers, painted a more complex picture. 13 concluded the speech with a reminder of the priority placed on civilians and rescue in their hero training. The words echoed in Izuku's mind and he pondered the practicality of such an emphasis in a world where villains lurked around every corner. Despite his reservations, he knew he had to play the hero's game, at least for now. The looming threat of the League of Villains added an additional layer of complexity to the situation. As the training unfolded, Izuku remained on high alert, prepared for whatever challenges lay ahead. The warp gate unfolded, revealing a blue-haired villain, his face concealed by a severed head, a grotesque sight that only hinted at the malevolence he carried. Following him was a massive, scar-ridden humanoid monster, a formidable opponent that immediately drew Izuku's attention. As the remaining League of Villains members emerged, numbering around 70, the class found itself in a precarious situation. While chaos ensued in Aizawa, Kan, and 13 took on the initial threats, an Eastern Imperial Eagle perched on Izuku's shoulder, carrying an earpiece and a note. Unfamiliar with this particular bird, Izuku read the note from Gaima, who detailed the significance of the earpiece, identifying Izuku as the staff sergeant for the snipers. With the instructions clear, Izuku connected the earpiece, issuing a directive for the snipers to stand by until further orders. Meanwhile, Aizawa, Kan, and Thirteen confronted the villains, and a new figure introduced himself as Kurajiri, an emissary for their leader, Shigaraki Tamura. Before the situation escalated further, Izuku discarded the rubber bullet magazine from his Act 205, loading live rounds. As Kirijiri began his ominous speech, Bakugo and Kirishima initiated an attack, but their blows passed through him, demonstrating his peculiar ability to transform into a smoky, incorporeal form, taking advantage of the chaos. Thirteen activated her quirk, creating a black hole to subdue Kirijiri. However, he countered by opening a warp gate behind her, redirecting the effect of her quirk back at her. As Thirteen fell, injured but alive, Kirijiri expressed his acknowledgement of their abilities. Unexpectedly, a series of warp gates enveloped the students, transporting them to an artificial lake in the flood zone. Izuku found himself on a boat alongside Mainta and Asui. Gazing around at the surreal setting, he muttered, Well, ain't that a bitch, as he casually slung the Act 205 over his shoulder and conjured an APS rifle. Amidst Minda's panicked exclamations, Izuku urged him to remain calm, emphasizing the unlikeliness of All Might's demise. As Asui's tongue disciplined Minda, Izuku delivered a pragmatic reality check. There have been a lot of villains that have claimed to kill All Might, but you know, it would be easier to predict a Black Swan event than to kill All Might. So how about you stop crying, because if you don't, the villains will be the least of your worries. As the shark-like villains in the water attempted to approach the boat, they were met with a barrage of bullets that wounded one of them, forcing a retreat. The villains exchanged mocking remarks about the supposed hero's bloodthirstiness, reveling in the chaos they had caused. Izuku, observing their reactions, understood their expectations well. Jesus, these are supposed to be heroes. One of the underwater villains taunted, met with laughter from his comrades. Izuku, unperturbed, raised an eyebrow at their comments, silently plotting his next move, turning to Asui. He began, All right, Sue, could you get Minta out of here? Her response was swift, offering a nod of agreement. Yes, I could wrap him with my tongue and jump to the shore, but what about you? She inquired. Izuku's smile held a hint of darkness as he reassured her. I'll be fine. Now go, you do not want to see this, he replied, a sense of determination in his voice. Asui complied, gracefully executing the plan as she jumped and landed safely on the shore, 
leaving Izuku to confront the villains alone. As another villain attempted to approach the boat, Izuku's response was swift and decisive, bullets punctuating the air with deadly precision. Three well-placed shots found their mark, causing the villain's face to bear the evidence of their lethal impact. With a dark chuckle, Izuku conjured ten marbles in his hands, each one a harbinger of impending doom. As he tossed them into the air, their number doubled, revealing their true purpose. The marbles transformed into twenty great white sharks, their core pulsating with dark energy. As the sharks descended into the blood-red waters, Izuku's ominous display of power hinted at the depths of his resolve in the face of villainy. With a swift motion, Izuku conjured another marble, unleashing its power as it struck the water's surface. This time, an LCAC, landing craft air cushion, descended from the sky, landing with precision on the blood-red waters. Without hesitation, Izuku leaped aboard the naval vessel, steering it skillfully towards the shore where Asui and Minto waited. As he rejoined his classmates, Izuku's eyes gleamed with a mixture of determination and defiance. Hey, you wanted bloodthirsty, right? Well, here, have some more, he declared, his voice cutting through the tension in the air. In his right hand, he formed five marbles, each pulsating with dark energy. With a forceful throw, they multiplied into thirty-five, unleashing a swarm of red-eye piranhas into the blood-soaked waters below. The ferocious creatures circled eagerly, ready to strike at a moment's notice. Simultaneously, Izuku's left hand held another set of five marbles. With a deft flick of his wrist, he sent them hurtling towards the water, where they multiplied into fifteen. The marbles transformed into Nile crocodiles, their powerful jaws snapping eagerly as they joined the fray. Turning back to his shocked classmates, Izuku's expression remained resolute, a testament to his unwavering resolve in the face of adversity. As the chaos unfolded around them, he stood ready to confront whatever challenges lay ahead, determined to show these villains that the heroes were the least of their concerns. Izuku, standing amidst the aftermath, pressed on his earpiece, addressing his unseen snipers. I need one guy to keep an eye on the flooded zone. If any villain manages to get to the shore, you use lethal force. Only one affirmative response echoed through the earpiece before he closed it once again, focusing on his classmate. Minta, visibly shaken by the brutality, stammered out, why you killed them. You didn't even blink. Izuku met his gaze with an unwavering stare. Should I feel guilty? Because the moment any of us would have landed in the water, they would have torn you to shreds. Asui interjected, expressing her unease with the situation. I get where you're coming from. But heroes aren't supposed to do th. Izuku cut her off, his tone cold and sharp. Oh really? Well, Endeavor has killed more villains than any hero alive. Have you ever questioned his methods of burning people alive while others cheer him on? Asui fell silent, unable to counter his argument. With a chilling laugh, Izuku continued, That's what I thought. And hey, who said I even wanted to be a hero? He tossed the asp to Asui. His indifference evident. Use it or don't. I couldn't care less. Now go. Asui nodded grimly, leading Minta away from the scene. Meanwhile, Aizawa lay on the ground, incapacitated by the beast. The blue-haired villain taunted him, and from the water emerged a woman, battered and wounded, determined to avenge her fallen comrades. She glared at Izuku and declared, You. You killed them all. I'll. Kill you. As she lunged towards him, a deafening gunshot filled the USJ. The woman stopped in her tracks, a gruesome wound where her left eye used to be. Diather, one of the unseen snipers, had made his mark. Pulling the bolt back and forth, he prepared for another shot, marking the first kill from the sniper's vantage point. In the chaos of the USJ, every action had consequences, and the battle was only beginning. The chaos in the USJ escalated as Izuku, fueled by frustration and determination, ordered his unseen snipers to fire at will. The response was swift and deadly, with multiple villains dropping from well-aimed shots echoing throughout the area. Simultaneously, Izuku created marbles in his hands. Throwing them into the air, they multiplied, conjuring forth a force of predatory animals. Ten polar bears, five grizzly bears, and twenty Eurasian wolves manifested under his command. A sense of grim satisfaction crossed Izuku's features as he directed his makeshift army, All right then, kill any villain you meet. The unleashed predators tore through the villains, creating a wave of fear and panic among them. The once confident invaders now faced a relentless onslaught from nature's fiercest creatures. As the snipers continued their deadly precision from afar, the USJ became a battlefield where the line between hero and predator blurred. In this unexpected turn of events, Izuku found an outlet for his frustration, letting the predators roam freely against those who sought chaos and destruction. The unfolding clash revealed a side of him that his classmates hadn't witnessed before, a force to be reckoned with, one capable of harnessing both the ferocity of nature and the precision of a sniper's bullet. Tamura gazed at Aizawa, standing before him, the Namu having efficiently dealt with the hero. With a sinister grin, he taunted Eraserhead. So, Eraserhead, those screams we hear, think those are your students, eh? 
Laughter echoed as Vlad King lay beaten a few meters away, surrounded by celebrating villains. Ha ha ha, one of the villains chuckled. We really showed those heroes, eh? Another added, yep, serves them right. I wonder how Yakota is doing. The third one chimed in, probably having fun with some of those heroin bitches. You saw the one with black hair, like she was asking for it really. Their vulgar laughter filled the air as they reveled in their perceived victory. Unbeknownst to them, in the mountain zone, Lavrenti Kapanads aimed his Anzio 20mm rifle, taking aim at the one who made the crude comment. The laughter died abruptly as the villain's left maxilla bone was replaced by a gaping hole, courtesy of Lavrenti's precise shot. The brief moment of celebration shattered under the watchful eye of unseen snipers, turning the villain's joy into a chilling realization of their vulnerability. As if the situation couldn't get any worse for the surviving villains, a deep, menacing roar reverberated through the air. Turning around, their hearts sank as they laid eyes on three massive polar bears stalking toward them. In the wake of these formidable predators, the ground was scattered with the mangled remains of their fallen comrades, evidence of the merciless onslaught inflicted by creatures with no sympathy or restraint. The chilling roars echoed a stark reminder that, in the chaos of their assault on the USJ, the villains had unwittingly unleashed a force far deadlier than any hero they had faced. The screams that had sent shivers down their spines were not those of their adversaries, but the tormented cries of those who had succumbed to the jaws of these relentless predators. In that moment, the surviving villains realized that their ill-fated celebration had placed them at the mercy of a nature far more ruthless than any hero or villain they had encountered. Throughout the USJ, the piercing screams of villains echoed, marking their grim fate at the hands of relentless predators and determined heroes. In the shipwreck zone, the once tranquil waters now ran thick with blood, tainted by the remnants of half-eaten corpses and discarded body parts. Those who had managed to escape the watery trap found themselves greeted by a barrage of bullets, leaving them lifeless on the shore, their bodies bearing witness to the brutality of their failed assault. In the landslide zone, where the remnants of Class 1B and select members of Class 1A had held their ground, camaraderie began to form amidst the chaos. Todoroki and his allies swiftly dispatched the villains, their united efforts laying the groundwork for a bond forged in the crucible of battle. Meanwhile, in the mountain zone, the villains faced a fierce resistance from Kaminari and his companions. When the villain Tesla attempted to assert dominance, his words were cut short by the swift intervention of an Eurasian wolf, leaving him to meet a grisly end at the jaws of his own demise. In the windstorm zone, Takoyami and Kota found themselves sheltered behind the walls of an apartment building, witnessing the relentless onslaught of their predators. As the grizzly bears and Eurasian wolves tore through the ranks of their assailants, even the formidable villain Yakota met his end in a whirlwind of blood and fur. In the fire zone, Ajiro could only watch in horror as the landscape was consumed by the merciless savagery of the wolves. With unmatched speed and ferocity, the predators turned the tables on their attackers, transforming the once determined villains into nothing more than fodder for the hungry pack. In every corner of the USJ, the unfolding chaos served as a stark reminder of the unforgiving nature of the world they inhabited, a world where survival often depended on the razor's edge between heroism and villainy.